Here. Councilor Gubinelli? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Lennon? Councilor Sullivan? Here. Councilor Sweet Payada? Here. Councilor Walsh? Here. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Uh, as the chair of the council, uh, I, it is my pleasure to make a special presentation this evening. And to do that, I'm actually going to go down there. Uh, so just one minute. As some of you may be aware, uh, Anne Swift Kayata decided not to run for re-election to the council this time around, and she is uh, therefore completing her fourth term on the council, uh, meaning she has been on, serving on the council with distinction for the last 12 years. And I would like to take this opportunity to say a few things about Anne Swift Kayata. Uh, she was first elected to the town council in May of 1999, thus is the only sitting member of the council to have served in the 20th century. <laughs> Prior to serving on the council, she was a trustee of the Thomas Memorial Library and served as chair of the trustees in 1998 and 1999. Anne was a Pond Cove Media Center and classroom volunteer. She served in 1999 on the Community Center Study Committee and had been president of the Cape Elizabeth Middle School Parents Association from 1996 to 1998. Aside from her town council work, Anne served on the United Way of Greater Portland Allocations Committee and now serves as a member and vice chair of the United Way Board of Directors. She also has been a director of the United Way Foundation of Greater Portland. She is a member of the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Rotary Club and organizes its lobster bake each year. She also has seen many months helping the club at the Wayside Soup Kitchen. As you can tell, Anne doesn't sit around very much doing nothing. Uh, she has worked to advance the interests of municipalities statewide, serving as an executive committee member of the Maine Mun Municipal Association, as chair of its legislative policy committee, and as MMA president. When a proposal came forward that would have ended majority rule on issues of mun municipal and school budgets, she participated as treasurer of Citizens United to Public Safety, Schools, and Communities. She helped lead the successful campaign and also helped to overturn a similar effort to take away excise tax revenues from communities. MMA will also remember her leadership in advocating for a new wing of their building that is used to train municipal officers statewide. While serving on the council for 12 and a half years, she has chaired the Appointments Committee, the Ordinance Committee, the Finance Committee, and has three times chaired the Town Council. She served on a task force to study the impacts of proposed tax caps and served on the Comprehensive Planning Commission, which met 29 times and held three additional public forums. She was a member of the Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee, which identified the need for a new vision for the library. Every position she has held has seen her devote countless hours to reviews and analyses on what are the best steps to move forward. When she sought a position on, as a town councillor in 1999, she told the Cape Courier among her reasons for running, through my education and experience, I have learned how to manage projects that require teamwork, the building of consensus and staying within a budget. I will listen well and work hard. Her prediction or promise in 1999 as to how she would carry out her service on the town council and beyond was spot on. The town council, recognizing that Anne has fully devoted more than 12 years of her life to extraordinary community service, decided, without her present, that the customary thank you for her service does not measure up to what she has accomplished. To recognize her for listening well, for working hard, for practicing teamwork, for building consensus, and for improving our community, Tonight, we announce that she is the 22nd recipient of Cape Elizabeth's Ralph Gould Award for Community Service. <laughs> the 
The award was established in 1986 to recognize those who truly make a difference to our community through volunteer service and has done so not only on the town council, but in so many ways helping people and helping organizations serving Maine citizens. This recognition of Anne is truly special as it is only the second time that it, that it has been awarded to someone while they are still serving on the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. The only other such recipient was Bill Jordan. Therefore, this recognition trumpets how much we truly admire what Anne has done for Cape Elizabeth. Congratulations, Anne, on being the 2011 recipient of the Ralph Gould Award. thank the council and um, everyone this was a surprise to me I just found out just before the meeting and uh, I was taken greatly by surprise but I want to thank the council not just for the award but for their support and their friendship you know I've learned many times uh, over and over again during my time on the council that uh, there's one great lesson nobody gets much done on their own when they're on the council or frankly in life so I need to thank four sets of people. First of all, in my 12 and a half years on the council, I've served with 19 different counselors, and I've learned something from every single one of them, so thank you. Secondly, I've also been lucky to work with Mike McGovern, our town manager, his staff, and what is the best, and I think the most professional set of municipal employees in Maine. I want to thank them for helping me learn more about Cape Elizabeth than I ever thought possible, and also for all that they do to make Cape Elizabeth a great place. The third group I want to thank is the citizens of Cape Elizabeth who have elected me four times. You have educated me, and you have kept me focused with your many, many comments <laughs> and many, many questions. But thanks to you, I have stayed on course when I've had to deal with some um, difficult issues. So I thank you for your participation in your government. It's what makes uh, government work when the people are involved. And I appreciate all that you've done to participate. And last day, I have to thank my family, my daughters, and especially my husband, Bill, because without their support, I wouldn't have been able to devote so much time to public service. You know, what we do, on the council and working for the town does, I think, make a real difference in people's lives. Uh, you know, roads and libraries and parks and sewers and planning and the fire services and police services and um, all those things. All those services are important to citizens every day and they're things that people really need. My years of public service have given me not only a passion for good government, but also a great deal of respect for municipal employees, uh, for municipal officials, both elected and appointed. You know, as corny as it sounds, I believe that local government is a noble calling. I mean, that sounds sort of funny, but for modest or sometimes even no pay, a lot of people don't realize that counselors don't get paid at all, we work hard to make our community better. I am very proud to have served among you and for you as all of us in municipal government have done what we can to, to, to do our best to meet the needs of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. So to sum up, it's been a privilege to serve and I, I appreciate the fact that I've been privileged to serve you. So thank you so much. Um, I appreciate all that my counselors, my fellow counselors, the municipal employees, and most of all, the citizens, all that you have done, all your respect and kindness over the past years, and sometimes even your, uh, your cranky calls or cranky emails, that's okay because it's important that you remain 
in touch with your government and that we remain in touch with you. My time on the council has been one of the most satisfying periods of my life, and that's due in no small part to all of you and to all of you. So thank you. Uh, the next item on tonight's agenda are town council reports and correspondence. Yes, yeah. um, uh, uh, Chairman Sherman, um, we would like to encourage the public to attend the Cape Elizabeth Fire and Police Appreciation event on Thursday, November 17, in the community room from 2.30 to 4 p.m. Uh, you will be able to thank our firefighters, rescue, wet team, fire police, volunteers, and police officers. Thank you, Jessica. Anyone else? Uh, this is then the first opportunity for citizens to comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda. If anybody would like to speak to an item that is not on tonight's agenda, please feel free to approach the podium and uh, Offer us your comments. Seeing none, I would ask for the town manager's report. Yes, uh, thank you, David. I just wanted to make note of, of the last election uh, first by thanking the town clerk uh, for her stewardship of the election and uh, also noting that on the town council, we, we had a, uh, he's not going to mention it, uh, that uh, Dave Sherman was reelected to the town council and Kathy Ray was elected to serve a new three-year term in the town council, as well as uh, we have new school board members as well, Mary Townsend returning to the school board, and I know all the staff looks forward to working with all seven councillors next year, and we'll, we'll tremendously miss uh, all that Ann uh, has done for the community. Uh, she, I kidded her today, she called me, and she, she always wanted, if there was anything wrong in any of the materials, I would always hear from her. And near as I could tell, she was on the council about, there were about 150 of these meetings, and I think I received 150 phone calls <laughs> over the years with all oh, this one little thing. And you know, this, there was one on the agenda today, there's a, there's a little typo where 89 appears inexplicably. And surprisingly today, she didn't pick that out. So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, she did find something else. So anyway, she, she'll be missed, and uh, she's been very special to work with, and I know everyone on the staff will miss her. Uh, I also wanted to mention uh, that the police department uh, last week or so, or maybe a little more than that, had a, a drug drop off, uh, people with unused drugs. And it, hard to believe, but they ended up having dropped off, I heard two different reports. One was 187 pounds and one was 189 pounds of, of pills and ointments. And you think, and this, didn't, this is after they threw away the boxes and the pill containers and all that, 180 eight, we'll say, uh, pounds, of, pounds of drugs. And I think, you know, one, it's a great service that the police department provides, but two, I think it, it also says something about maybe we're overprescribed and giving away too many pills that, <laughs> that people don't need, but I'll let the medical community figure that one out. Uh, I also wanted to make note that uh, during the last month we received delivery of a new rescue unit, and hopefully most of you won't be using it directly. Uh, but uh, it, it uh, is now on the road, and I think will be a, a tremendous asset uh, for citizens in the area. Third, uh, Jessica mentioned, uh, I think mentioned the library. No, she, you didn't today, no. briefly. Uh, she, she always mentions the library. <laughs> and you know, I really encourage, this in the different community newspapers, uh, there's pictures of what the, 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 the totally redesigned library looks like from the one that was included a couple of months ago. We, we received lots of citizen input and uh, basically the design looks totally different than what you may have seen uh, a couple months ago. Uh, for the most part, we've gotten most, mostly positive comments about it and just encourage you to look at the newspapers and to send input to the town council, uh, in, in the, particularly in the weeks ahead. Uh, it, uh, I think the plan is making progress and it is something that the citizens may very well be voting on uh, next November. So I, I think it's, it's, it's important for everyone to try to influence it uh, early rather than later in the process when you know, it really comes down to a yes, no vote instead of trying to influence some of the particulars within it. So uh, th there's, there's a lot going on and uh, look forward to the meeting. All right, thank you, Mike. 
Uh, the next item is to review and approve our minutes from the October 12, 2011 meeting. Is there a motion? Move to accept. Seconded. A motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, Jessica? Yes. Um, I was not here last month, and my understanding is I will not be able to vote on these minutes as I was not present. Okay. Any other comments or questions? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, before we begin the rest of the agenda, I, I did want to point out to the people that were kind enough to come out tonight that we have five public hearings scheduled this evening. Uh, some have generated a lot of interest, others have not. Uh, and one reason why we have uh, scheduled the hearings the way we have done so is because Councillor Sarah Lennon is at uh, an event for her daughter and won't be able to arrive till about 8.15. So what I, I and the town manager tried to do was to arrange the agenda to ensure that for the more uh, controversial items or, or the ones that have generated more interest would like to have her back for that. So I do apologize uh, for those who, folks who may have to wait a little bit longer, but the order of the hearings are first on the proposed rezoning of Turkey Hill Farm and Lovett Airs Parcel, uh, then the next hearing is on the proposed fireworks ordinance, the third hearing will be on roosters, uh, the proposed roosters ordinance, the fourth hearing would be on the proposal to charge tour buses a fee at Fort Williams. And then the fifth hearing would be on general assistance guidelines. So that is the order, and I suspect that by 8.15, we'll have Councillor Lennon back, and she'll have the opportunity to hear folks' comments, at least with respect to the roosters, uh, or proposed roosters ordinance going forward. So that was why we did this the way we did. Um, uh, what we try to avoid in the council is ending up with a 3-3 vote when obviously we have the ability to have Councillor Lennon here uh, to make it an odd number, which would then mean we could either pass a measure or not. Um, so the first item for a public hearing is the proposed rezoning of Turkey Hill Farm at 120 Old Ocean House Road and the Lovett Airs Parcel behind Loxley Road from the RB zone to the RA zone. Uh, if anybody would like to speak on this issue, please come forward to the podium and uh, identify yourself uh, by name and your address or your affiliation to Cape Elizabeth, and we welcome your comments. Hello, uh, my name is Bob Dodd. I live on Loxley Road. And um, here today, just to very briefly, because I know it's going to be a long meeting, um, but to, several neighbors are here, and they've asked me as well to speak for them, rather than all of us coming up here, uh, this, uh, express our support for, it seemed like there was a general consensus that the 18-acre the, uh, parcel behind Loxley was uh, one that pretty much everyone felt, or there was a consensus that uh, they, it should be conserved. And I really want to um, support Mike McGovern's efforts and work on behalf of the, the, the wood, wood parcel there and the, the important trail links that are there. And you know, that, those woods really do support three large neighborhoods, three large subdivisions, and really goes up into the Northern Cape area where uh, woods are becoming scarce. So um, I certainly support um, <coughs> that being made you know, conservation property as quickly as possible no it almost makes moot the point of how it's zoned so we just support uh, all the work that mike has done and it's been an enormous amount of work to find the heirs and to negotiate with the heirs um, the um, transfer of the, their ownership of the property over to the town and it really was our understanding that um, the negotiations were that with the understanding that the property would be uh, made uh, conservation property, pro conservation land. And it's, you know, it's just very important to all three neighborhoods. I think you'll see people there all the time. It's not just the trails, but it's the woods surrounding the trails and the link into the, the wetlands and the connections to the um, 
to the Stone Gate Trails and then into the um, Robinson Wood Trails. So it really is quite an end to a trail system that um, you know, everybody in that town has worked very hard to, to really develop the screen belt system. So, thank you. Me. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak on this agenda item? Okay, I'll then now close the public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Phil Clifford. Good evening to all of you. Um, I live in Freeport, and I'm a Lovett heir. Um, my mother was Mary Lovett, and her father was uh, Philip Lovett. And um, we are very concerned about this property, too. Uh, we want it to stay natural and beautiful uh, with, with use. Um, um, but we're concerned about a couple of things. Um, over the past few years, a number of trails have been made on the property, and no one or organizations have contacted us as to what our input might be as, as part owners of, of this property. Um, and, um, you know, we pay our taxes on it every year, and uh, I would like to be included. In, in the, the future. Um, um, in the flyer, um, it has, was stated that the town has gone to great lengths, and, and I know I've talked to Mr. McGovern uh, about this property and the, the town wanting to acquire it uh, from us, our, our, our share of it, I should say. Um, and it, is, it sounds like it is a key property in the green belt system, from what I am understanding. Um, and, um, and we were wondering what the town is planning to do. Like I say, you've contacted us a couple of times over the three, four years, uh, but we really haven't heard anything in the last year or so. And it sounds like you're starting to move rapidly on this. Um, or trying to anyway, acquiring this property um, for the town. Um, and um, and that was on the, the town website I got that information from. And the real value in this property is, is not now, it's in two or three generations from now. Most of the land in Cape Elizabeth is gonna be bought and sold and probably bought and sold again. And it's those residents then that are going to really enjoy and appreciate what you do now. Um, the decision to sell our heritage has not been an easy one, uh, but we are going to put our sliver, our share, however you want to call it, um, up for sale. And we welcome anybody that is interested in, in contacting us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak uh, uh, with regard to the proposed rezoning of Turkey Hill Farm or the Lovett Heirs parcel? Okay, seeing no one else, I will now close the public hearing. Uh, item number 142-2011, uh, the focus here is on Turkey Hill Farm. Uh, and again, the proposal is to rezone this parcel from the RB district to the RA district. What that means essentially is that this property is no longer designated or will no longer be designated as a growth area within the town, uh, given that it is subject to a conservation easement. Uh, from the town council's perspective, this was really uh, a matter of housekeeping to, to clean up the ordinance to apply the right designation to this property, given the existence of the easement. Uh, would anybody else, Jim? Just, I, I'd like to move. Um, move Turkey Hill Farm to be rezoned from RB to RA. Okay. Second. As described in 142-2011. The motion's been made and seconded. Any further questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor of the motion? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, the next item is number 143-2011. This uh, relates to the rezoning of the Lovett Heirs parcel. Uh, 
which is behind the Loxley Road in the Sherwood Forest neighborhood, again, moving that from the uh, RB zone to the RA zone, and again, the same uh, rationale applied. This did not appear to be an area where there would be significant growth, and the idea was, again, to do some housekeeping to put this into a designated uh, zoning classification that would not be considered a growth area. Jim, do you have a motion? Yeah, I'd move that Love It Airs parcel, which is um, um, to be rezoned from RB to RA. Second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Caitlin? Um, I just have a few concerns about moving it kind of prematurely before we get acquire all of the ownership of the land, because we have all this talk of preserving it. <clears throat> right now we don't have full control of it to preserve it. It's one thing with Turkey Hill Farm that there is an easement currently on it, so moving it from RB to RA, there's no question that nothing could ever happen to it. But if we're not able to preserve Love It Airs as we intend and we fully intend to do, my concern is moving it from RB to RA, you actually open it up to having growth on it that's more restrictive and allows more development on it than if we leave it in RB whereas it has to preserve more open space should it be developed. I'm not saying that there's any intention to, I'm just saying that I would like to at least put something in there that we need to move as quickly as possible to make sure that we are preserving this land because if we leave it in the RA and it ends up in 20 years getting developed, there's not going to be nearly as much open space preserved on it under the current RA regulations versus the RB. That's all I have to say. Uh, thanks, Caitlin. And I, I just may ask the town manager, it's my understanding that the town owns an undivided interest in this parcel and that there are maybe one or two heirs that own a very small percentage of an undivided interest. So any ability to develop that parcel is frankly non-existent. But if you could speak to there or close to. Yeah, I'd be happy to speak to it. As has been explained over many years, uh, with some we did some title work to find out uh, amongst the Lovett heirs exactly who owned what percentage interest of the land. It, it ended up, I believe, there were probably, I could be a little bit off, about 12 heirs. Uh, we had acquired early on some of the fractional interest in the property uh, through uh, tax acquired property. Some of the some of the owners didn't pay their taxes. There were a number of owners, five or six, that were paying their taxes. And we, we looked at the appraisal of the land and we uh, made them all offers. And with the one exception of the Cliffords, uh, they accepted our offer. Uh, so now we, have, we own 97% of the interest in the entire parcel. Uh, the, the, Mr. Clifford or the Cl Cliffords, I'm not sure whose name it's under. The Cliffords or Mr. Clifford? Cliffords. Cliffords, yeah. yeah. The Cliffords have about a 3% roughly? Roughly, yeah. yeah. roughly a 3% fractional interest. And we've had a disagreement as to the compensation for that 3% of the interest. That's natural. Uh, and, you know, as I think as Mr. Clifford said, there's a special affinity for the property as well because it, it is the, the heritage of, of the Lovett heirs. For those that might not be aware, it's the same Lovett family that Lovett's Field in South Portland is named for. There were, there was a, a series of Lovett families in Cape Elizabeth. So, you know, if, if uh, Mr. Clifford, you know, we, we could still have discussions with him and I would entertain more discussions, but, you know, for him to sell off, you know, his 3% interest, my understanding from our attorney is that we'd really need to identify a sliver of the land to, to, uh, to make part of that 3%. Uh, and anyway, that, you know, we're hoping we can still work something out. And, you know, we've gone back and forth. And, you know, and I, I don't think, we've, as he said, I don't think we've talked for about nine months. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's basically where it stands. So he has about a, the, Mr. Clifford has about a 3% interest. We own 97%. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Are there any other questions or comments? I'd, I'd like to comment in, uh, in support of a point that Councilor Jordan raised, which is um, concerning RB versus RA. It, it, is, it is somewhat confusing, but in fact, as I understand it, and I know the town planner is here, she may be able to support my statement, that preserving open space is a priority of the town, and it's my understanding that RB actually is more effective because if a subdivision is triggered, 
then, it is, then there is a mandatory um, review of that with the possibility of the town receiving 40% of that property. So with Turkey Hill, it, there's already a conservation easement that's already protected. So I, I certainly would um, um, be concerned about that if, if that is viewed, if RA is viewed as being a, a vehicle for protecting property, I, I don't see that as being the case. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Any other questions or comments? Frank. I'll simply echo, I think Jessica's point is correct. I agree with the point, except in this instance, yeah. for all practical purposes, it's not really possible for that land to be developed. So it's sort of a moot point, I think, and therefore I'd support this. Uh, 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 and I, any other comments or questions? In many ways, that's why this came up and came to the Ordinance Committee, is because the fact that 97% of it is controlled by the town. Okay. Caitlin? I just want to say it, it's a moot point so long as what we say we want to do, we do. But if this whole council turns over and a new council comes on and we haven't preserved that land, then moving it to the RA does not accomplish what we want. That's my only point, that if we don't preserve it like we say we're going to preserve it and new councillors come on and they have a different plan 10, 15, 20 years down the line, having moved it to the RA now allows more development in that space, not less, which is what we're trying to accomplish today. So I'm just saying, big red flag, go up. If we're going to do this, then let's make sure that we do the other thing we say we're going to do and get that accomplished so we don't end up kicking ourselves later. Any other questions or comments? Uh, again, I'm, I'm in favor of the motion. Um, when we are trying to define growth areas in our town, I, I just don't think it's appropriate to include this area, which the prospect for development is, in my view, non-existent. Uh, understanding some of the views that have been expressed, I, I, I go the other way. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion? Four in favor, opposed? Two opposed, the motion does carry, thank you. Uh, we now have our second public hearing of the evening on the proposed consumer fireworks regulations. Again, if anybody would like to speak to this issue, uh, we welcome your comments. Please approach the podium, identify yourself by name and address, or your affiliation to the town of Cape Elizabeth. I will now open the public hearing. And I will now close the public hearing. Um, Mike, I don't, we, I don't know if uh, you would like to uh, offer some comment or defer to the board. Ordinance Committee, Jim or Frank or Ann. Uh, Jim? Yeah, I'd like to move that, um, that we adopt a new Article 5 of Miscellaneous Offenses Ordinance regarding the use of sale of consumer fireworks. Uh, the State of Maine uh, has proposed regulations that go into effect in January. And, um, Many other communities around us have already established an ordinance um, regarding fireworks. And uh, this uh, ordinance committee took this uh, under advisement at uh, two meetings ago. And um, we've uh, talked to the chief of the fire department in terms of uh, what his opinion is. Uh, and uh, at this point, we think that what you have is a, um, is a, is a uh, a good representation of the discussions we've had and what is what we consider best practice in many of the other communities that surround us. So I've moved that uh, we accept the, the Consumer Fireworks Regulations, item 144, 2011. Uh, thank you, Jim. Is there a second? A second. Uh, thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the motion? And the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, the next uh, hearing we have on tonight's agenda relates to uh, roosters. Um, although Councillor Lennon is not here, I am comfortable moving forward um, I, I, just because there are a lot of people here tonight who I think want to speak to this issue. Uh, and my, I am uh, guessing that she'll be back hopefully midstream. Uh, before we open up uh, this to a public hearing, I, I did ask Jim Walsh, who is chair of the Ordinance Committee, just to give a, a bit of a preview, uh, which may help people uh, understand where the council is at in terms of this particular topic. Jim? Thank you, um, David. Uh, this was referred to the 
town council back from the planning board and uh, the ordinance committee took up several meetings to discuss uh, how to deal with the roosters uh, here in town. What you have in front of you, um, while I uh, would suggest that uh, it was our best effort to try to control the rooster component, unfortunately it approaches this in a more aggressive way than I think that the Ordinance Committee intended. So while I see that we have quite a few folks here today, um, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that we have our hearing, that we get the input from citizens who have a lot to say about this subject, and that what I would like to do when the time comes is to recommend that we defer this to the full Town Council at its next regularly scheduled workshop, which I believe would be December 5th. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jim. And, and in fact, uh, that approach to issues uh, in the past has been used where we've had the public hearing and then the council has decided to uh, defer the issue to another workshop. So I'm now going to open up the public hearing and would welcome uh, anyone's comments who would like to speak on the issue of roosters. Uh, if you could, because it appears there are a lot of people who want to speak to that issue, if this young man would be first in line uh, up there at the podium, and then maybe followed by his sister. And then for those additional citizens who would like to speak, please line up behind them. You each have up to three minutes, but if you form a line, then we avoid the dead time and the drama that it takes for someone to walk all the way from the back to the front. It would help things immensely if folks would line up. So. Something. Yeah, Does could you put a chair? a chair up there for That's good. Thanks. Okay. these fine citizens? And, and if you could again please identify yourself by name and address or affiliation to the town and then you, we welcome your comments. Okay. You may go, sir. Hi, my name is Ben. Where do you live? I live on two lakes. And what do you want to say? What do you have? I have chickens. And what do they do? They don't make loud noises. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, my name is Annalise Gordon, and I live at and I live in Cape Elizabeth. What if me and my friend get a horse, and it takes three years to get the money, and that horse makes too much noise? I think that barman. Don't make too much noise. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and just for the, the next folks who speak, you may not get the natural applause that the first two speakers <laughs> have got. But if, if folks in the audience could refrain from applauding, because there are, are individuals who may have a contrary view, and we just want to be respectful of all points of view as, as individuals come up to speak. So. Great, thank you. And my name is Kelly Gordon, and I live at 110 Two Lights Road. And I'm going to address this issue basically as the way it was written tonight. I know your comments that it was going back, but my comments are addressing it exactly the way it's issued. Um, I'd like to make a couple points tonight. Um, today I spoke with the police department regarding loud noise complaints over the past year of a horse, a cow, a sheep, an ox, a swine. And do you know how many complaints there were? Zero. Zero complaints. I then again, I called today the animal control officer about complaints over the past year over a cow, a sheep, an ox, a goat, or a swine. How many complaints? Zero. Zero complaints. No complaints on chickens, a couple on roosters, a couple on roosters, and mostly dogs. Zero complaints. This is not a need. There is not a need for a town ordinance. My second point is to address the term rural character, preserving rural character. It's a term that's used over and over again. This is what the term rural character means to me. <clears throat> Taking my kids to Strout Farm to pet the horses. Driving by my neighbor's house to see the sheep. Watching my children take care of their hens and gather eggs. And you can bet the person that drives every day over the bridge through the traffic in South Portland and heads up Route 77, appreciates the rural character of Cape Elizabeth. When they cross over that town line from South Portland into Cape Elizabeth, do you know what they see? They see a field of horses. Sometimes they might get lucky and they might get 
caught at the traffic light and they see a field of horses. This is what the rural character of Cape Elizabeth means. Now there's a house for sale across the street from that stable. What if a new neighbor complains that a horse is neighing too loudly? What happens then? What if this neighbor's issue is not really about the horse? I have never heard a horse neigh all day long. I've never heard a cow moo all night long. What if this issue with this neighbor is not about the horse or the cow or the chicken? The way this is written now, it could be. My third point is this. If you vote yes on this ordinance, you are sending a very clear message to the people of Cape Elizabeth and to my children that you do not support farming in Cape Elizabeth. Now, each and every one of you sitting there and going, oh no, that's not what we're saying. That's not what I'm saying, but yes, that's exactly what you're saying. Farm animals make noise. It is a part of farming life. It is a part of the rural character of Cape Elizabeth. There have been zero complaints. If you, zero could, if complaints. you could wrap it up. Okay. To vote yes on an ordinance that gives the power to a few people to change the way of life if a farm animal makes a loud noise is sending a clear message that you do not support farming in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? Hi, my name is Maddie Gears and I live at Three Young Lane in Cape Elizabeth. I'm here to tell you my story. My story would be very different if my friends and family could not have farm animals. Four years ago, my mom let us buy four chickens at Longhorn and Buxton. We bought them home and raised them. They were Belgium Danfords. I heard about a 4-H poultry club and I joined. I learned about caring for chickens, I learned about eggs and egg production, and I learned how to show chickens at the Maine County Fairs. During my first year in 4-H, I showed my bantams at the Cumberland Fair. I, would lo I loved walking around and seeing all the kinds of different chickens at the fair. I especially liked oh, the different kind of livestock at the fair. I especially liked the dairy cows, and while I was at the fair, I met a woman who knew all about 4-H, and she told me about the All-Star 4-H Dairy Club. Even though I didn't own any dairy heifers at the time, I joined the club, and I have been an active member ever since. Our dairy club learns about dairy industry, goes on trips to tour farms, <coughs> excuse me, has a state dairy judging competition and a state dairy quiz competition. We travel to Eastern States Dairy Competition in Massachusetts, and qualifying for club members go, on, com go to compete at the nationals in Kentucky. We show up many of the main county fairs and attend dairy conferences in Vermont. We learn how to prepare our heifers for shows, including clipping, bathing, and health. We learn nutrition, health, and sound dairy management. We also are involved in a lot of community service. We do projects and demonstration for the elderly in the nursing home in Gorham. We bring animals and do demonstrations at libraries, Bridgeton Health Center, and public meetings. We are involved in breast cancer awareness and participate in Real Life for Life. We do ag agriculture education at many elementary schools. All the senior members in our club participate in a good buddy program where the older members, such as myself, are paired with junior members to help them learn how to clip and bathe their heifers and help them at fairs and shows. This past year, I wrote an essay and presented my 4-H record and portfolios to the Noise Foundation at Pineland Farms, an effort to win a calf for college program at Pineland. Myself and another 4-H'er from Corinna Maine were chosen to win calves. This November, two other 4-H'ers and myself were represented, will represent Maine at the National 4-H Congress in Atlanta, Georgia. This is an opportunity to participate in leadership and community service workshops and demonstrations with kids from all over the nation. At the end of each 4-H year, we have to turn in our 4-H record and portfolios to the previous year. These records are feats of organization, take weeks to prepare and document our projects with our heifers or poultry, depending on what club you are in. I'm sorry, you're bumping up on three minutes, if you could finish up. Yep. They include accounting of all the money we spend in our animals and projects. I can say for myself that I was surprised at all the things you can try and see what you're best at. I've tried dairy judging and clipping contests at the Quiz Bowl. I've learned how to set goals and work hard to achieve them. I've learned how to build friendships and I've learned how to deal with the most difficult animals. 
I would not have been able to have all these experiences if it had not been for 4-H. I really hope you do not pass this ordinance and deny other 4-H kids and other, for ad, other agriculture experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, would you like to speak? Hi, I'm Beth Engel. Um, I live with three young lady, Cape Elizabeth. <clears throat> I'm worried about uh, the ordinance and its wide sweeping reach into the keeping of livestock and poultry in our town. I believe that there are many unintended consequences caused by this ordinance. Um, the council should take into consideration the economy of farming or even the economy of small households raising animals for their own consumption and use. It's a very delicate economy and the intrusion of the town into that equation, uh, already tentative, can end farming for that family. 4-H and also agriculture. A neighbor complaining about an escaped chicken can result in a $50 fine. Uh, that <coughs> represents the end of the chicken for that family. 4-H is another matter which my daughter just spoke about. Um, I think it's very, very important for kids in our town to be able to join 4-H. And if you can't have a little bantam chicken because your neighbor doesn't like it, then you won't be joining a poultry 4-H club. I believe that the ordinance, uh, as it is written, runs afoul of the state's right to farm law. I doubt that the council meant to write it that way, but the way it is written, it appears that if a neighbor complains about noise from animals on a working farm, then the farmer can be fined. Maine farmers' rights cannot be subverted by local ordinances, so I think there's an error in the drafting of this ordinance. I feel that there's an obvious solution to this problem. It's all started about roosters. I'm a chicken farmer, and I'm here to tell you that all chickens go in at night. If you have a barn, you leave the door open. When it turns dark, they go in it. If you close that door on that rooster, it won't crow all night. It's in the dark. They only crow when there's light. So if you make an ordinance that says everyone <coughs> with land of less than 100,000 square feet, which precludes them from being a working farm, has to close their roosters in at night, at dark, and let them back out at 6 in the morning, you pretty much solved your rooster problem. Seeing how there's only two complaints that I know of in the last couple of years, it ought to settle it pretty well. Even if they crow at night, when someone turns on a light in the barn, it's going to be muffled because they're indoors. You have to keep roosters indoors anyway at night, because if you don't, the coyotes in Cape Elizabeth will eat your rooster. <laughs> and they will eat it. There's no doubt about it. So close them in at night if you're on piece of land under 100,000 square feet and let it out in the morning. And I may say, close it in at dark. They let themselves in at dark. If you say dusk, they're not in yet, and you can't catch a rooster. But if you say dark, they're in. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Good sir. evening. Um, my name is Mitch Mason, and I am not a Cape Elizabeth resident, but I am the 4-H youth educator for the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. And last week, a few residents of Cape Elizabeth called and asked um, if I'd heard about the ordinance and if I had any information that they might be able to share with you tonight regarding research involving youth involvement with agriculture. And I do have some information. So I'm really here tonight just to share some results of research that has happened to help you make an informed decision. Um, just some background, we have 10 4-H members in Cape Elizabeth directly involved with 4-H animal projects. I'm hoping to have two more um, pretty soon. Um, and I wanted to share with a couple of studies that have been, have been done on uh, positive youth development in animal sciences. One was through Rutgers University, and they did a study of 4-H alumni asking them um, what their participation in 4-H has meant for them in terms of life skills. The highest correlation was related to being able to accept responsibility, relate well to others, be inquisitive, um, make smart choices, and public speaking, which you saw tonight. Um, what was interesting um, was that many of the 4-H's were not in agriculture careers, which shows that anim raising animals is not necessarily about becoming a farmer. It's about learning the life skills that develop from being responsible for an animal. Um, I'd also like to highlight that in University of Maine 4-H program, we are tied with, you know, with the campus in Orono. We emphasize science, technology, engineering, and math skills through our 4-H projects. Um, next fall, if Maddie wanted to, she could go to Orono and learn to turn milk into bioplastics, use nanotechnology um, to solve medical problems, 
um, tour the state-of-the-art food science facility. So there is, it goes beyond just the raising of the animals. Um, another study by Tufts was a longitudinal study. It, set many, it showed many of the same results as the other study. Um, it also showed that 4-Hers as adults tend to be more civically active. They're more likely to set goals, more likely to see themselves as competent, and they're more likely to be able to cope. Um, so there are a lot of evidence, there is a lot of evidence out there that ties raising animals, being involved with 4-H, with uh, positive youth development. So, thank you. Thank you. My name is Pat Salvi Bothell. I live at 90 Ocean House Road in Cape Elizabeth. And I am the proud owner of 22 laying hens who will make a raucous noise if there's a hawk circling. It calls my dogs out to get rid of the hawk. They're amazing. They all, they all work together. I would like to see a different kind of ordinance in Cape Elizabeth. I'd like to see one that says that every homeowner has to have three chickens. I don't treat my dogs for ticks or, or fleas. Or, I don't have to put any chemicals on them. We have no ticks on 14 acres. Not a one on my grandkid, on my dogs. It's a chicken's favorite treat. <laughs> it is, they will search them out. I don't have lily beetles anymore for those oriental lilies. I let the chickens into my flower bed and I thought, oh, they're gonna destroy everything. They eat all the lily beetles, so now I'm not putting that milky spore stuff all over the ground. I really wanna to talk to you more about the fact that you're making an ordinance where there really isn't a clear problem to solve. You've already heard that there have been no complaints. And right now, my family is also known as Fox Run Farm. We are trying to start a pick your own blueberry uh, operation. And we have already spent $15,000 in fees because of ordinances that have been put in place that say if one of your neighbors doesn't like what you're doing, you need to fight that. And the only way to fight that is to hire landscape architects and real estate lawyers and people who can understand things that this homeowner doesn't. That is an undue burden. They're blueberries. They're not going to make any noise. They're not going to run in the road. But this is what ordinances do. You have to step back and say, what am I solving? And am I solving something at, at the cost of creating a whole new problem? If you have a neighbor that doesn't like you, if you have a new neighbor, as someone said, suppose somebody buys that $400,000 house across the street from, from the horse farm and they just don't like horses. All of a sudden you can say, well, they're stomping the ground, they're making noise, and the police are gonna come. They don't happen to witness it, but you've got this person making a complaint. I really, I think you need to slow down, take a step back, and really think about if you're solving an existing problem or writing an ordinance for something that doesn't exist. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paul Seidman. I live on Oakview Drive in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, the things I'm bothered by in terms of noise are wood chippers, leaf blowers, lawn mowers, and crows. Um, I'm not at all bothered by any farm animals um, and welcome them being part of our community. Uh, as I read the ordinance, I'm aware this has been sort of on the table for a while being discussed, and it, I was shocked when I read what was come up with because, it, I mean, Jim acknowledges it just seemed to go so much farther bringing in animals that have never been discussed before. Um, and I feel like it goes against a sort of overriding value to preserve and protect our agricultural community. And I consider the animals part of that community and the children who work with 4-H. And I would hate to see an ordinance passed that sort of straight-jacketed people who are working towards that. Thank you. Thank you. Penny, welcome back. We've Hi missed there. you. Hi. <laughs> I'm uh, Penny Jordan, and I'm one of the owners of Jordan's Farm here in Cape Elizabeth at 21 Wells Road, as well as uh, chair of the uh, Cape Elizabeth Farm Alliance. Um, 
I'm often at meetings across the state, and um, I was at a meeting this past uh, Saturday doing a presentation, and somebody raises their hand, and they said, and it was up in Bangor, um, wonderful, wonderful uh, meeting, and they raise their hand and they say, could you explain to us how Cape Elizabeth has done it? How have you created such a farm-friendly community? Um, and my answer was, we're blessed with very intelligent and progressive people who truly value agriculture and farming in their town and value the heritage of their town. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I say that with all honesty and, um, and so as I step back and I think about how Cape Elizabeth sets the pace for the state from a farm-friendly perspective, I think we need to step back and we need to say, okay, how do we set the pace from a food production perspective? And that's where I come to stand here today because this ordinance as proposed may seem a bit benign to some, but it really starts to uh, attack somebody's ability to grow and produce food. And I go back to statements that have been previously made. If I own property and I choose to um, grow my own food, that can be vegetables or it can be chickens or it can be goats or it can be lambs. Um, and we should all have the right to do that. As a farm, I'm uh, protected by the right to farm law. And, uh, but as a non-commercial producer, um, I'm not protected by anything except the wisdom of the people who helped to create the ordinances in our town. And so I ask that you step back and you think about that, yes, there are instances where neighbors can move in and say, I just don't like smelling those sheep. And, um, and they may then complain. So how many complaints do you need to get before you can't raise your own food any longer? So um, I would like to just reiterate, I'd like Cape Elizabeth to be the community that sets the pace and really proves that we can be a food production friendly town as well as a farm friendly town. Thank you, Penny. Yes, sir. Uh, Jody Jordan, 83 Old Old Channel Road, Cape Elizabeth, Alwaza Farm. I'm afraid if you pass this ordinance that it may be just the start of ending a lot of farming in Cape Elizabeth, even though I may be exempt because I'm commercial. And everybody else has spoken against it so far. Hopefully you'll listen. And same as when you listen to the people ask you not to do away with the dispatch center, you did it anyway. So please listen carefully this time. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak on this issue? <coughs> I'm Peter Eastman, Turkey Hill Farm. Many years ago, early 20s, my parents bought that property. And uh, next door was Phantom Farm, and owned by Clint and Mary Davis. Uh, the Davises came up one time and proposed that uh, they would like the Eastmans to put Turkey, to, uh, put Turkey Hill in conservation of some sort, so that it would not be developed. Well, as you know now, Turkey Hill is in conservation easement, will never be developed. Phantom Farm is now known as Broad Cove. Take a look at it, drive around in it. Nothing but developed. And if anybody wants to see a real live rooster, we get two of them. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? All right, I will now close the public hearing uh, and we'll disclose that I actually live in Broad Cove. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think the intent of the council was to address concerns of people who live in densely developed residential neighborhoods uh, where a neighbor has a rooster and it's keeping them up at night, not to attack the ability of farmers to earn a living or even to 
undermine the town's rural character. And so I do think taking a, a, a nod from Jim Walsh might make some sense to step back a bit and try to rework this so we can balance the interests that we've clearly heard from tonight along with some of the concerns that people have had about being disturbed by roosters in their neighborhoods. Yes. I heard a mention of the December workshop. I'd, I'd like to say, I, I think it'd be better to delay it till after the first of the year because it's clear to me there needs to be a, an informal dialogue with the Farm Alliance as well. And I'm not sure what the Thanksgiving holiday, they've got a lot of work to do, uh, if, if the timing is uh, that good to try to have it done by December 5th. I don't see any issue with that. Yeah. I don't either. I mean, I, again, we've, this has been on the table for well, almost two years. So I, I'm all for getting this right at the end of the day. That's, I mean, this has been great input, frankly. Okay. All right, so but I'll ask you a, a procedural question. Do we need to vote on the draft up or down? No. I don't think so. I think we can uh, okay. have a motion. We can make any motion we want. OK. All right. Just uh, needed to understand from procedural. That's all. And? Uh, I just had one comment, which was um, I'm part of the ordinance committee, at, or at least for another couple of weeks until a new counselor is sworn. And um, two comments. One was a couple of people had said there was absolutely you know, no reason to be discussing this, no, no need. And believe me, the ordinance committee has been busy enough so that we wouldn't have been discussing it just for the fun of it. There have been, you may not be aware, but there have been several people in town who were very concerned about roosters that were right next to their house and we were trying to deal with that. There are none of us on the committee as, as it's presently comprised who are farmers or I believe who are chicken owners. So, you know, we did our best, but we obviously didn't do a very good job. Um, and my second comment is that this has been great. You know, this is just how it's supposed to work. I wish that we'd had the benefit of hearing all these comments at the ordinance committee level, but, you know, we didn't. Um, I'm sorry that people got sort of fired up because, you know, I'm just sorry people got agitated, but, but it's good that people did because now I think we have some good suggestions. I was particularly taken by, um, I didn't catch her name, the lady who talked about roosters going in at night and they don't crow if it's yeah. dark. Well, you know, who knew? I didn't know that and nobody came to the ordinance committee and said that, so that may be a practical solution. <laughs> I don't know what we'll come up with, but I just want to thank everybody because I think if we'd had the benefit of all this, we might have been able to shorten it. But on the other hand, that's how government goes, so we'll do our best. Uh, Frank? Just, just to reiterate, re reiterate what Ann said, um, we did our best at the ordinance committee to solicit public input and bring some people who know roosters into the process. Uh, we missed the mark, obviously. And I'm glad we're getting, this is what it's for. This is getting yeah, I, I good insight and good information. So we can respond to the need in this town. We're, we're, yeah. There's no need here for us to make rules that don't need to apply. OK. Jim, would you like to make a Just motion? An, another comment, because oh. part of the three, three ordinance committee members, I think the lesson I've learned from this is I think we reach out for those that know better or know more about this than we do. And rather than to just simply have meetings, announce those meetings, and expect people to come, we probably need to be reaching out to those that understand it better than, than we do. So, uh, so without, I'd like to move that we, um, uh, we table this, uh, the rooster ordinance amendment uh, discussion for, for a workshop that will be scheduled in January. OK, is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? There's no oh, I'm sorry. There isn't to be no discussion since it's a tabling motion. All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, for those of you who wanted to speak on roosters, you are welcome to leave. But if you do leave, I would just ask you to do so quickly and quietly because we do have another issue uh, that we'd like to get to.
working. It's working. Okay. Uh, uh, we will resume our agenda for this evening. Uh, we have a public hearing scheduled this evening for proposed fees for commercial passenger transportation vehicles at Fort Williams Park. Uh, the same rules apply. If you'd like to speak on this issue, please come forward to the podium. Uh, you'll have up to three minutes to give us your comments. Please identify yourself by name and address or affiliation to the town of Cape Elizabeth or relation to this particular issue. I will now open the public hearing and again, if there's more than one person who wants to speak, please line up over there so we can try to move this along. So if anybody would like to speak, we welcome your comments. I'm Roger Rio. I'm speaking also with my wife, Chris. We live at Five Bridal Pathway. If you don't know where that is, it's Sherwood Forest, which is the development directly across from the park. We support charging buses and trolleys for park access. But first, maybe a little bit of history. In our 37 years, we have witnessed many changes to Fort Williams Park. Earlier on, it was not the beautiful place it is now. It took many years to develop the park into the valuable asset, and I emphasize asset, that it is today. Early on, the park was dangerous and a messy place. There were beer bottles, another litter in the heart of the park. Many of the buildings were in bad repair to the point of being dangerous. One day back in the late 70s, my family and I, we had young children, witnessed a drug buy. It has changed many times over the years. We witnessed the burning of Goddard Mansion and the destruction of many of the buildings. We witnessed the filling in of the batteries. Development of the current access road, it's changed over the years. That, was not, that road was not there initially. We witnessed the development of the walking paths, an addition of a new soccer field, which we sorely needed, a museum and a gift shop, the Beach to Beacon 10K, and now the Arboretum is being developed thanks to the efforts of a small group. I had the good fortune to coach Little League and soccer in the park. The soccer field is the best venue of any field in the state of Maine, a source of great pride when we hosted a team from another town. Much to my disappointment, the town council voted to limit any development for our children to play in the park. That was a few years ago. No new fields can be developed forever. Yet we continue to welcome companies who are making money on our very valuable attraction. As I said, in the early years, the park was not necessarily an attraction. Over the years, we saw more families visit the park, and we saw school buses that came for spring outings. The park is so busy in the first warm days of the spring that we feel we cannot go there because there are so many people. Not a complaint, an observation. Now we have buses and trolleys that bring tourists to the park. Some say that we should be welcoming and not charge them for using the park. I feel that these profit-making companies are taking advantage of us. Imagine you have an oceanfront property and a tour bus in front stops in front of your house and lets a crowd of 50 to 70 people out to walk around. They love the views and appreciate your generous spirit. Some smoke cigarettes and drop butts on the ground for you to pick up. Some knock on your door to see if you would let them use their bathrooms. Sir, if you could just wrap it up. I will. I'll just one, 30 seconds. What does I feel is happening today? Some have commented that other towns don't charge to visit their parks. I suggest this is a unique situation. Those parks don't have private parking and porta potties for their visitors. Most are not nearly the size of Fort William with all the roads and open spaces that require maintenance. Certainly none has the views that we have, and yet we continue to provide free access. We invested a lot over the years, and buses and trolleys are making money. The Fort Williams Committee has determined this is a good way to fulfill that Sir, responsibility. Need... Let's just do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sir, Denison, 63 Spurt Wink Avenue. And before you again, apparently, I disagree with the gentleman who was just here, and I was one of the ones that helped develop the 
fort and it's solid and beautiful. I was involved in the de demolition of them. The ball field he's talking about, look at the nice lawn, and, and, and that was not a speck of loam put on it. It was all clean beach sand, thanks to Bob Malley's father who worked for the agriculture people. Been a lot of time by prior councils throwing the bunkers to make it safe since back in the late 70s to get it to where it is today. Could it be better? Yes. Could it be worse? I don't think so. I think we're doing a good job maintaining what we've got. I don't understand why the council feels they got to keep pushing these fees. Every time it's come up, the people have been unanimous against it. <clears throat> And yet you challenge that Fort Williams committee to look into fees again. The last time I stood before you, charging buses, travel agencies, that was all discussed. When we went to the polls to vote, we knew what we was voting for. You can twist the words around any way you want. But, you know, let's face it, we've got a nice park. It seems like we can't get enough money to spend. Maybe we should be looking at cutting the costs. Why do we have to plow that fort on overtime? Have we ever done a utility study on that fort with all the committees and things we've had? What are the conditions of the utilities? I think these are far more concerned. But why state funds, federal funds have been involved? We've got a historic place there. Why do we have to nickel and dime the almighty dollar? There's more to life than money. And I don't think that, uh, I think the people have spoken well against this in the past. And I don't understand why it keeps coming up. The last time we walked out of here, there was a big group outside that said, we'd be back here again because the council don't like what we did. We're back again. Uh, you know, we're mowing practically the same lands that we did 20 years ago. We had two part-time school kids and one full-time. How many full-time employees do we have managing the park now? Maintaining it. You're still mowing the same areas with a lot nicer, bigger, and quicker equipment. I think if you be looking at nickels and dimes, they add up to dollars fast. And I think our employees are doing a good job. But I think we can you look at yeah, why uh, we ought to do a breakdown. How much money are we getting back for mowing the school lawns? Uh, two costs reflected there. The other town ground. So is this being passed to the fourth for me? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Greg Gordon from 110 Two Lights Road. Um, I have been a long. I grew up here in Cape Elizabeth. Moved away and came back here about um, five years ago. Um, I work with all the buses and I am a direct result for the majority of the tour buses for the cruise ship passengers coming into here to Cape Elizabeth. Um, I believe that we are definitely interested in supporting the town of Cape Elizabeth, but I think that it needs to be a just and equitable uh, decision on if you're going to charge tour buses, it needs to also be charged for everybody else. I think that there's other ways to create revenue for the town of uh, Cape Elizabeth with Fort Williams. Um, if you're going to be charging franchise fee to the beach to beacon, then maybe there's going to be a revenue source from that side. Um, expanding the gift shop um, to a manner that allows the buses that are coming in here with the tour bus passengers um, enough cash registers to buy all the items that they want to buy. Make that a little bit larger. Um, put in a restaurant that, that competes with the uh, clam bake in Scarborough. Um, these are all different ideas that are out there. You know, someone was talking about having a um, um, urns that we put on the side of the wall at uh, Fort Williams. So there's all different types of revenue sources that are there. All that's to say to you is that make sure it's just and equitable across the board. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Joe Edgar. I live at 20 Robin Hood Road and I'm definitely in favor of uh, charging for tour buses and trolleys. Um, our Edgar family has lived next to Fort Williams for 43 years. We love the place. We feel protective of it. We applaud all of you who have done such a good job to bring it to the condition it is now. Uh, in fact, we voted against uh, parking display fees because we feel that it 
should be shared with our neighbors. But uh, tour busing is really a commercial a situation, a commercial endeavor, and those that uh, use those services expect to pay. And this is not going to be a hardship for those who ride on these buses. It'll probably be a dollar or less. And I volunteer at the Portland Headlight Museum, and I know the people who ride on those buses, they're not going to worry about the slight increase in their bus ride. They give a lot of uh, money to our gift shop. They're generous contributors to the museum. And I think that this, I certainly hope that you vote in favor of this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Greg Ditchwood. I own Custom Coach and Limousine, probably one of the largest motor coach companies in the state of Maine. So we're in the park a lot with the cruise ship passengers mostly. Um, I'm not sure why we're here. This went out to vote. The voters voted. They voted it down. We're back again. We seem to be a target. And several people I read in the paper, and I've heard it tonight, that motor coach companies and trolley companies are making money hand over fist. Well, I don't know about you, but the economy is killing every motor coach company I know of. I'm on the board of directors of the New England Bus Association, and every one of them is struggling. And every additional fee, you can't just keep passing it on to the passenger, pass it on to the passenger. It doesn't work. So we're going to end up eating that fee on a lot of these trips. Many tour companies have already put out their tours for 2012. Don't have this fee included. Many, many companies are going to show up not expecting to pay, cut, get to the gate, and they're going to say it's $40. Many of them are going to turn around and go, uh, go back, not going to the park. It's, it's not a destination for us. It's, it's an attraction. Uh, the cruise ship passengers don't really need it. They see the Portland Heli from the water going in and the water going out. We can eliminate that. These figures you have of $35,000 in gross revenues, you're not going to see that because the numbers are going to fall in half if this fee goes into a place. It's just not that. And it's, it's a great venue. It's a great uh, facility. The cruise ship passengers, the tour people love the facility. The biggest complaint we have is there's too long of a line in the gift shop. They can't spend their money. That's what they want to do. They want to come and spend their money and buy little souvenirs from the gift shop. But if you keep adding fees onto these uh, <coughs> trips and, and the next town does it, and the next town does it, before you know it, it's unaffordable. And it's just going to hurt everybody. So I think you're going to see half of these buses not go to the park anymore. If that's your goal, it's going to work. But I don't think that's your goal. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jesse Timberlake. I live on Hunts Point Road, and um, I kind of agree with the, uh, disagree with the gentleman who just spoke. And I believe that most folks who voted against pay display fees were voting against fees for um, cars and for people walking in. And um, <clears throat> I understood at the time that trolleys and buses would pay a fee, so I was stunned, and a lot of my friends were stunned also when the town council decided that buses and trolleys would not pay a fee. And I would like to respond to what uh, Councilor Sherman said in Portland Press Herald. Uh, and we do live in the same neighborhood, so that's OK, I guess. While I truly respect his point of view, and I'm going to quote, um, if we end up charging people from away, referring to trolleys and buses, it would seem to me we are not sharing this wonderful treasure with the rest of the world, end quote. I submit that sharing <clears throat> is a two-way street. And we, the citizens of the Cape, through our generous volunteer time, work and energy, and money, have supported the park by ourselves. We would like now the buses and trolleys to share our financial burden as they share our treasure. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Lynn Schaefer, <clears throat> 650 Shore Road. 
and I have spoken to you all not that long ago in my um, position on the Arboretum Committee. I want to be very clear that I'm representing only my opinion tonight, not the Arboretum. But in the work that I've been doing with the Arboretum, I've become very aware of the limitations on, of the current maintenance of the park. I think the guys do a great job with their limited budget, but there's so much more that has to be done to bring back the park and to take control of plants that are, are taking over the park. We need more money to support the park you can't keep raising taxes to do it. It seems to me that this gives us a good option for raising some money. The tour bus operators may not be making a huge amount of money on it, but they are making money on it. And it seems to me it's only appropriate for the town to share in that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mary Page and I live at 39 Forest Road and I'm here to support the proposed fees for buses and trolleys and I'd like to echo with the, what the woman before me just, just said. We do live in an era of limited budgets. I favor open parks, open spaces, public access, but we do not live in an ideal world any longer. We now in Cape have user fees for ambulance services. There are user fees if you have to dump more than a trunk load of brush at the transfer station, user fees to dump a big item. Um, many user fees. I just bought a water heater and there was some sort of fee or I had to pay or my contractor had to pay down at Town Hall. So in the ideal world, yes, we would share this heritage with everyone. It would be free. But it is not an ideal world and there's a limit to which you can make taxpayers pay. I think the ordinance as proposed is an ideal compromise because it is not hitting residents. It's not hitting our neighbors. Uh, from South Portland, it is the trolley companies and the, corpor the corporate or companies that will be um, paying this fee. Thank you. Thank you. Fred Prince, 2 Rocky Hill Road. Roger Dan Rodney Dangerfield uh, made his name by saying he had no respect. He got no respect. I'm sorry, but I feel that applies to you folks also. This is the third time you've asked the Fort Committee to come back with new ideas on how to create new funds for the Fort. This is the third time they came back with the same damn answer. You get no respect. That was voted down. 61 to 49. And Mike went out on the buses and did a survey. And he did a report on the town council meeting saying, yep, we can make money. We'll go out and we'll raise eighteen, twenty thousand dollars It's going to cost us $14,000 to do it. So it's only $6,000 or $7,000. My numbers are wrong, but I'm in, I'm in the ballpark someplace. After those meetings, we got together and we showed the town how to make, how to save four, five, six hundred thousand dollars in costs. We weren't interested. We asked the school committee to save money. We got no respect. They came back and said, "There's nothing in our budget now, twenty-five million dollars we can save." I think it's time that this town council took the bull by the horns and told these committees that when you go out and we ask you to do something, you do it. If you don't do it, you get rid of them, and you find people who can. The fort can be sustained. You're looking for a lousy $40 a bus. You got 20, 30, 40 people in that uh, bus that will spend a lot of money in a gift shop, which one of the uh, tour operators told us two or three years ago. They tell the guests, don't go into the gift shop because you can't get out in time to get on the bus. We got one cash register. Hello? You got 40 people coming there who'll spend a heck of a lot more in profits than the lousy $40 on the bus, and you haven't got to, you haven't got to uh, go out and try to create a whole new structure to, to, to support this. I think the town council has got to start taking control of this town. And when you ask the committee to do something, you expect them to do it. And not come back with the same tired answers they've come back with the last three times. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jean McGurn from the Main Tour Connection in Portland. I um, have been in business as a tour operator for 28 years, and I'm going to give you a little information, I guess, from the other side of it. 
Greg is my colleague that does the cruise ships, and I handle a lot more of the other general motor coaches that come into the park and come to visit Portland Headlight. And as I look out here in this audience, most of you are the people that are riding on those motor coaches. They have retired veterans, senior citizens uh, that have come from Ohio, Kansas, Boston, or wherever they may come from, because Portland Headlight is a national icon that they deserve to see as much as anybody else does. And the thing that is what I find with the whole, this whole situation is that it's discriminatory against those who ride on motor coaches, regardless of their ages. We talked about it before, about if somebody came in in a cab, they wouldn't be charged, but because they're on a motor coach, they're going to be charged. Um, overall, it's a discriminatory fee. Um, when you talk about tourism, I'd like you all just to take a minute and think of how many of your kids, how many of you were employed in tourism-related jobs. It's the biggest industry the state has. It's the only thing that's keeping the state going right now, as far as I'm concerned. And if you think about, you know, when you worked at the late lobster shack, or you might have worked, you know, on one of the farms, or your parents did, it's the trickle-down effect as well. Um, I've been a tour guide on those coaches. I know what the, uh, you know, what the people, what the revenue can be in terms of that provided jobs for several employees of my own. They get tips, it's wages and tips that go into the coffers. It's not a big buck business. The bucks are in the places, as everybody has said, get something else out there in that gift shop. Get a TV tray out there and put a fish and tackle box out there so they can buy postcards. You're gonna drive away more people than you're gonna bring in by imposing these fees. As Greg said, 2012 is planned for many of these people. They're gonna, you're only gonna tick more people off than anything. They drive up to find that there's a fee. The motor coaches, the drivers aren't necessarily the tour company. You're going to hold up a group of people for this $40 fee that the driver isn't going to pay because it's not his tour. The tour company wasn't aware of it. How you're going to administer it, to me, these figures just don't add up. As the other gentleman just said, you're going to lose more money than gain on that $35,000. There's nothing here that talks about administrating that, and I think that's something that's always left out of the equation. Um, and just one other thing, you know, when you talk about um, people and the impact of the park, it's a seasonal thing as far as the impact of the park. They're in there, they're out of there. I mean, if you look at the daily average stay, perhaps, of people that you could uh, wrap up. So I ask that you rescind on these fees and we don't have to come back here again until next year. Thank you. Thank you. Betty Crane, Starboard Drive. Um, I was going to say a few things about the history of the park, but I'm afraid I have to say a few other things right now. When we voted pay display twice, we voted it down. It had nothing to do with other fees, absolutely nothing. It was only pay display for cars coming into the park, getting a sticker. People seem to have read something into this that is not there. We have fees in the park. That pay display didn't say we could never charge a fee. We charge for weddings, we charge for the shelter, we charge for the gazebo or the bandstand, we charge commercial people that come in perhaps to make a movie or something. There are lots of times we have to charge fees. And we are at the point now where Cape Elizabeth has, they were given this, this damn, just marvelous piece of property. True, we paid for it, but I mean, God gave us this right on our coastline. This little town owns this. We have done a marvelous job. We have done it by not charging. We have done it by taxes. We have done it by volunteers. We've done it by different programs, people helping in the park. But we need additional revenue. We don't want to raise taxes. I think that's something you will all agree with. But we do need some money in, in the park. And the buses have been coming for years free. We love to have people come, whether they come from South Portland or Scarborough or whether they come from Egypt or China. But 
they come free, and that's what we wanted when we voted. Now, we have to face the fact that we need some money, and the buses have been enjoying the profits of coming here for years. And $40 is practically nothing. In fact, I would hope that the buses would not raise their tour price. I would hope they would absorb it themselves, because I would stake my life. If you polled the people on the buses and you said a dollar of your fee for the, for the tour is going to the park, I think they would be delighted. I think they would feel good about paying an extra dollar. I hope they don't if you have could to. could wrap it up. It's great. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Next time I'll read this. <laughs> uh, would anybody else like to speak on this issue? All right, I will now then conclude the public hearing. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming out this evening and speaking on this issue. Um, perhaps we might have a motion first and then entertain some discussion. Would anybody like to make a motion? Uh, I'm going to defer that to one of my fellow counselors. Uh, Jessica. Yes, I'll make the motion that we uh, approve the Fort Williams Advisory Commission recommendations in charging for uh, buses and trolleys. Thank you. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, discussion, question, comments, Anne. Um, I have a few comments just to explain where I'm coming from on this one. Um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, I'm going to use my mantra that I've used for the last 12 years. Reasonable people can disagree <laughs> <laughs> on this one. Um, I originally supported uh, the concept of parking fees, the pay display fees for all vehicles, buses, trolleys, passenger cars, whatever, um, using Fort Williams. But though I originally supported that, I will vote against fees for buses tonight for a number of reasons. First, it, it doesn't seem fair to me uh, to charge bus riders, and in effect that's what happens because I believe the bus companies will pass the fees through. It doesn't seem fair to me to charge bus riders when we do not charge people who arrive in taxi cabs, which are also commercial operations, or private vehicles. I believe that people, including senior citizens, who cannot drive themselves and thus have to come by bus or cab, would be unfairly penalized for arriving at the park in public or group transportation. So that's one reason. Um, Secondly, I think it's inconsistent to charge some commercial vehicles, buses, but not others, taxis. Um, I also think it's inconsistent to charge some buses, the commercial ones, but not other buses, the nonprofit ones or the school buses, because they all put use on the property. I think the numbers don't work. When you look at the fees that you would be collecting, the proposed fees that would be collected, uh, I also take into account the impact on the sales at the shop. Uh, I, I think we need to consider the cost to the collect the fees and when it all shakes out, I don't think we're going to make any money off of this and the whole point of it is to make money to, for upkeep of the fort. So I don't think that's going to work. Um, and then lastly, I think the citizens of Cape have voted twice uh, against charging vehicle fees at the park and for keeping the park free. I remember the signs that said no fees, keep the park free. Um, and I think a lot of people did think that they were voting for keeping the park free to everybody. Um, I believe, even though I disagreed with this, I think the people have spoken on this issue and I respect their decision that they want no fees. And so I will be voting for those reasons against charging these bus fees. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak on the issue? Yeah, Frank. Um, respectfully disagree with Anne on most of her <laughs> points. Uh, and I won't go on very long because most of the uh, comments that have been made tonight I agree with. Um, I guess it comes down to really two things. One, um, I don't see it as being discriminatory. 
that you can't put on the same basis of comparison individuals going into the park on their own versus profit making entities using our scarce resource really and secondly um, we're going to need to drive uh, revenues in order to support the park now and in the future and uh, costs of maintaining the park and the way it should be maintained will inevitably rise and we can't continue to uh, uh, carry that burden entirely uh, on the capabilities of the taxpayers, and um, so I will be supporting this. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Caitlin? Um, I just want to say I, I support the idea of charging com the commercial operations and the tour buses, but I, am, I do have my reservations about whether or not we'll make more or lose more based on what we decide to do here today on our revenues because of the effects that putting that charge on the tour buses will have. Whether or not we'll lose more in the gift shops by making more from the tour buses and call it a wash, I don't know. And so it's definitely a decision that has weighed heavily on me as to whether, you know, you go one way or go the other, which is the right decision. And so I just wanted to, to let people know that this has been a hard choice to make and it's not something that we've taken lightly. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, Jim? Uh, you know, again, um, Mr. Prince talked about what we had uh, sent to the Advisory Commission, on, in his opinion, three separate times. Um, you know, there's a lot of talent in this town, a lot of people who, who ask good questions, do their homework, study the issues. And this group has been entrusted by this group to look at the care of this park and look at the long-range plan. And we've gone back to them. Yes, we've asked for their recommendation. They could have come back and told us, we don't believe that bus fees are appropriate. They didn't. They came back and told us in a very well worked out plan that we believe that we should be charging the buses. I come down on this thing that, and, and I guess I've, I've, I've um, listened to all the arguments, I mean, up to and including today with a counselor who was leaving today. I had a rather substantive discussion about it and uh, couldn't convince her to change her way in terms of how she thought about it. But I can't believe that a business, whether it's a trolley company or coach, a tour operator, can listen to this debate that has gone on in this town about this subject for the last several years and not come forward to work with this council with the commissioner or with somebody, even appoint an intermediary, and take the moral obligation that I believe they should take. This, is, this entire enterprise has been on the backs of taxpayers in Cape Elizabeth. And I just believe that there's got to be some skin in the game. They're taking this incredible asset that is world known, and they are selling tours with that effort that we've all expended money on for years and they're going to the bank with it and I believe very strongly that we need a piece of that to come back to us. When I go down there and see how the buses choke the road network around that lighthouse I'm just absolutely amazed but it just happens because there's 22 of them on site and then I've heard people complain about the porta potties that they don't pay for. And I've heard bus drivers saying, don't use the toilets on the bus because it involves a whole great deal of effort that goes on behind the scenes. The bottom line for me is that the bus companies, the trolley companies, are a commercial enterprise and they need to assist us in what I consider a moral obligation to support this park. Lynn Schaefer said some very, very telling things here. She's been working, I'll call it in the trenches with the Arboretum. And I think that when you get into this park and you work there, you volunteer there, you see the amount of work that is required to keep it the asset we keep hearing it is. And I believe very strongly that this may be $34,000 a drop in the bucket, but at least it's moving towards having some equality in the way in which we're all approaching this park. So I'm going to vote in favor of this. My hope is that the, especially the commission, 
that we've been entrusting them to manage this park will look upon this as supporting them in the hard work that they have been assigned. And I would anticipate we'll have additional discussions going forward about everything. But when I have people tell me that we shouldn't be charging buses, why are we charging TD Bank North? Why do we charge for the shed? Why do we charge for the gazebo? Why are we charging for weddings? Why are we charging $2,500 for somebody to have a license to sell product like we did this year? I mean, the bottom line is if it's going to be free, should it be free to everybody, including every one of those enterprises I just talked to you about? So I'm there. I believe it's fair. I think it's consistent with where we're headed. And at the end of the day, I thank the Commission for their hard work, and I will support them in this motion. Thank you, Jim. Sarah? Just very briefly, um, thank you, everyone, for speaking. I thought it was an excellent debate. I loved what Betty Crane said, and I have to agree with her that it's, it's inconceivable to me that a, a tourist on one of these buses would not be utterly delighted to pay one more dollar to see this national treasure. It's beautiful. They're excited to see it. We welcome them there. We're talking about a dollar. I think that given what they pay to be on the ship and to be on the bus and in our, uh, in our gift shop, I think that, I mean, looking in a less cynical way, people say it's just about money. Well, really, it's about the human spirit and people's, I think, willingness to share. I agree with Betty. If we polled them, 99% of them would say, I am thrilled. Where do I put my dollar? Um, I like what Mr. Prince said, that we should have more cash registers. I wanted to put Caitlin's uh, concerns to rest. I really think if whole tour buses are saying, please don't go in there because you won't have time, that's a much bigger hit than the very few that will turn around and not come in. So if we are concerned about people not spending enough on the gift shops, let's line up the cash registers and get people ringing them up. Um, I, I just think that in the spirit of everyone sharing and everyone delighting in this treasure that they'd like to see up kept, I think that it makes a lot of sense and I will be supporting it. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Jessica? Did... Um, it's been fascinating to listen to the comments tonight and in the pre previous public hearings. And I've been thinking about this a great deal. I've been publicly in favor of charging buses, as you all know. And I still am. When I was a child, I would ride my bike through Fort Williams many times and often see not another soul in the entire park. We, we bought this. The town bought it in the 60s. We've had it for years. The Cape Elizabeth taxpayer has been making wonderful improvements to the park in all this time. And to, for the betterment, betterment and enjoyment of everyone that comes. I do think, however, that given that it costs us hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to maintain this park, um, and given that years ago when we first acquired it, I could ride my bike, I would never see anyone. Now, every time I go, I see hundreds and sometimes thousands, I think, of people. And so there's a lot of use. We have a responsibility to maintain this in all these safety venues that, that, that are appropriate. I think that charging for-profit commercial entities is reasonable. I think this is a reasonable effort to help support the park and maintain it so that it is safe, not, not just pleasant, but safe. I think that I certainly hope that our, our uh, gift shop sales are not adversely affected, but we're going to have to see what happens. And so I'll, I'll be supporting this. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mike, did you want to offer a couple of comments? Yeah, just very briefly, and the, the sort of side issue is not direct on point. I, the gift shop is a very successful gift shop, does about $500,000 worth of business a year. And it does do it with two cash registers most of the time. Uh, <laughs> Let's I'm, get not, three. <laughs> I'm not sure where, where the story came that there was, there was just one, but uh, we do have two cash registers most of the time. Otherwise, I don't think we'd ever have $500,000 in sales. And, and secondly, I think it's been pointed out, you know, the bus industry, trolley industry, uh, you know, they have been really good partners over the years. Uh, they've worked very closely with Gene Gross at Portland Headlight. Uh, and, you know, th that's really appreciated. I know, you know, particularly when, when Gene first came on, uh, Gene uh, McGurn uh, 
was very helpful uh, in providing advice, helping to set up systems and how things work. And, you know, I, I just, you know, I, you know, they're business folks like everyone else, and it's tough times. And I, I greatly appreciate them defending their industry as well they should and informing us of issues that may or may not happen. I just think, you know, they're getting a little bit of an unfair shake here. Uh, not that I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with the policy. Uh, but, you know, I really think, you know, they, they have cooperatively worked with us. And, you know, it seems the votes are here for this. And, you know, I really would like to work with them to set up so that, you know, some of the fears don't materialize and, and we can work with them. They, they do provide a lot to the economy in the area. They've been very good to the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, but, you know, as, as has been said, you know, the, there's lots of different opinions. Buses do, do have impacts. And uh, I'd just like to say, you know, a, a word of thanks to them uh, for the dialogue over the last few years. It appears they're going to come out on the, the, the side of it that they don't want the vote, but at the same time, it's, uh, they have worked mostly with us. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I wish this were more suspenseful and I'd be the last vote and everybody would really hang on every word I say, uh, but I will say uh, that I am going to vote against this motion. Um, I, like Ann, uh, I was in favor of pay and display fees for all vehicles that entered the park. Uh, the public disagreed with the council not once, but twice. Uh, and given that, and given that the message of that campaign, with all due respect to Ms. Crane and others, was a no fees, keep it free, I have taken that to heart and believe that uh, access to Fort Williams uh, should not be something that becomes a charge. And so I'm looking at this issue trying to figure out, okay, well, why are tour buses different? Because obviously a lot of people in town think that they are. And I actually agree with Sarah Lennon. And if we put this, maybe you didn't say this, but if we put this out to a town-wide vote, which I don't advocate doing, but my guess is it would actually pass. I think a, lot, a, a, a majority of town citizens that I've spoken to uh, favor fees. Uh, but I, I, I don't understand the distinction, uh, except I'll, I'll go through what I think are the arguments, and then I'll do my best to refute them. People say, well, buses are different because they're making a profit off of us. And although that may be true, uh, it it seems to me inescapable that when bus companies are paying tens of thousands of dollars a year in fees, as they add up over the course of a season, they're going to pass that cost along to their customers. So although people want to keep it free and share the treasure with the world, uh, people in this town seem quite happy to uh, not keep it free for people who happen to come into the park on a bus. Uh, I've also heard that, well, people on the buses, they're from far away. Uh, they'd be happy to shell out an extra dollar for coming into the park. Uh, you know, they're not like our neighbors in South Portland or Scarborough uh, or Portland who we really want to welcome to the park. We want to use it for free. They're different because they're from far away and they can afford it. <laughs> I think that justification, with all due respect, stinks. Uh, again, the idea was keep it free. Uh, allow access for all to come to the park, but if you happen to be from far away, and if you happen to be able to afford an extra 50 cents or dollar for your bus tour, we'll take it from you. Um, another argument I've heard, which I don't like, uh, but I've heard it be made, is well, buses impose a greater burden on the park. They line up and they choke uh, the whole area around the lighthouse. I've been to the park a lot like a lot of you have. I don't see people on bus companies uh, vandalizing uh, the uh, military installations around the park. I don't see people from bus companies uh, walking their dogs and perhaps not picking up after them when they visit the park. I don't see those people using the tennis courts. I don't see them using the soccer fields. I don't see them using the little league fields. I don't see them using all the other things that everybody else who gets to use it for free uses. Uh, in some respects, these people have the least amount of impact on the fort and what do they do when they come to the fort? They look at the lighthouse, and they spend money at the gift shop. Uh, yeah, I don't like bus fumes. I don't like idling. But it seems to me we can address the concerns about bus traffic and bus impact through another mechanism. Um, I think what this all boils down to is that people in our town just don't like the buses. Uh, and I know people will disagree with me. But in fact, at the end of a, a workshop, one of my fellow counselors said to me, uh, just wait, David, until you move across town 
and live near Fort Williams, you're going to see all those buses go by and you're going to hate it. Well, uh, whether I hate it or I don't hate it, I don't think matters. In my view, it is not, simply not fair to charge some people to access the park, but not all. I've listened now to the town votes twice. I actually regret sending the last referendum out because clearly the, the t I misjudged the town's reaction to a, a pay and display system. Uh, but with that vote in mind, I cannot in good conscience vote in favor of fees for tour buses. So I respectfully disagree with my fellow council members, uh, uh, but I recognize that uh, you can't win them all. Would anybody else like to comment? Let's vote. You had one who was in, in the same camp. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I understand. You, res <laughs> you respectfully disagree with all of them, but agree with me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so the motion uh, uh, the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor of the motion? And those opposed? Yeah, the motion carries five to two. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Folks, we do have more items on the agenda. If you would be kind enough to uh, uh, leave quickly and quietly, we would appreciate it. Lillian, we're having a five minute break.
We are back on the air, so to speak, uh, and we'll resume our agenda. Uh, item, excuse me, I'm sorry. We have another public hearing scheduled for general assistance guidelines. If anybody would like to speak to those issues, we welcome your comments. Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing. Uh, item number 147-2011 are the general, excuse me, the general assistance annual update. Uh, is there a motion? Jim. I move that uh, we accept the general assistance annual update as described in item 147, 2011. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item number 148-2011 is a report of the Open Space Management Study Committee. Uh, and we actually, I believe, received a copy of this report at our last workshop uh, for anybody on the council. Did everybody get a copy? Yes. Uh, yeah. Frank, did, did you want to say anything about this? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's, okay. That's okay. Yep. I'm the, uh, the liaison for Conservation Commission and the Open Space um, Management uh, Greenbelt and uh, Management Plan. Um, we're very pleased to submit this draft for the council's consideration. Um, I would like to make a very special thank you to our town planner, Maureen O'Meara, and her staff as, uh, for countless hours in helping us do this, as well as the Conservation Commission and the Open Space uh, Management Study Committee. Um, this is the first time that the town has had a document of this nature, and so it's very exciting. Um, this deals with management of the open space. It does not focus on acquisition, but management of the space that we have. And we also now have cataloged every single piece of that that's in the town. And, uh, and in, addition, uh, in addition to that, we now have uh, maps online. Um, we have cataloged uses. So as you go through that document, um, you'll see that uh, very soon, once the council approves, you know, if someone wants to take a, a walk on a trail in Cape Elizabeth or maybe play ball somewhere in open space, they can look on a chart online and see what the uses are of that space, if, if there are any restrictions or and why. Some of them are deed restrictions. So I think this is going to be an incredible to, tool for all our citizens. And so we're pleased to present this and hope that we can uh, look at it um, in more depth at an upcoming workshop. Um, Oh, thank right. you. Thank you, Jessica. And so we will be going through this and reviewing this uh, at a workshop. Uh, do you, would you like to make a motion? Yes, yes. Um, I move that, um, that we review the uh, draft open space and greenbelt management plan at the, uh, w w would you want this for December or January? Future. There, at a future, future workshop is what, what you say? Okay. <laughs> at a future workshop. <laughs> is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? I, I just I think this is a great piece of work. Uh, compliments to the Conservation Commission and in your leadership, Jessica. Oh, thanks. It was, a, it was quite the collaborative effort. It really was. Thank you, Jessica. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion? The motion carries. Thank you. Item number 149-2011. Uh, the Arts Commission, we as a council held a workshop um, regarding the Arts Commission and its future as an ongoing board uh, and the general sentiment uh, of the council at the workshop was that uh, we may want to eliminate that and come up with another way to promote the arts within the town of Cape Elizabeth. Although a public hearing isn't scheduled, we do welcome public comment, again, uh, up to three minutes per speaker for a total of 15 minutes. So if you would like to speak, we welcome your comments. Thank you. My name is Julie bassett and I'm a member of the Cape Elizabeth Arts Commission. And um, my function on the commission is managing the Thomas Memorial Library Gallery. Um, I, I just want to say that um, we on the commission um, empathize with your decision to dis disband the, the commission as a, um, a town organization. Um, however, we're a little um, unprepared to uh, deal with the, the transition to uh, becoming an independent organization. So we're, um, 
we're uh, asking the the town council to uh, give us uh, uh, to the end of the year to to get our uh, act together, so to speak. And also, we are um, we are working with uh, uh, other town arts organizations just in the, this last week since since being notified of of, of this uh, decision. And it seems that most of the independent arts organizations are 501c3s. So we'd like to ask the town council to consider uh, giving the uh, arts commission in its new independent organization the funds to be able to create a 501c3 for itself to be able to become a, a, a nonprofit independent arts organization. Thank you. Does anybody have any? Questions for this representative? Yes, Frank. Uh, two things. First, the proposal is to expand it by the end of the year. Are you suggesting have it, that, that that occur later than the end of the year? Uh, no, we're not suggesting that, but we're asking the, the council to to consider funding us to become an independent organization so through and funding you're looking for is the legal fees associated with yes. not you're not referring to the budgeted item allocation. That, that this proposal includes. Talking about the, co the literal cost to do the final. Yes. How much is that? Do you know? I, I haven't had time to really research it. It seems to be a couple of thousand dollars. So, Mike, did you want to speak to yeah, that? Yeah, just I, I think to, to answer Frank's question, the, the Ask Commission first got a draft motion, and it, it didn't have the December 31 date. I, I heard back from Jay that they had met. And they wanted the delay, so the draft motion that ultimately went in the agenda reflected the conversation. Actually, the whole draft motion reflects what I understood the Arts Commission wished to have following their initial meeting. And so we've, we've tried to, to accommodate the, the different concerns. Any other questions or comments? Is there a motion then? Sarah. I move we vote to discontinue effective December 31st the appointed Arts Committee. Uh, commission as an official town board and encourage them to create an independent citizens group to promote arts in our community and I include in my motion the rest of the draft copy here which includes the suggestion that we provide you some funds for what you need to get going and any other support help that you might need that government can help you with that may be done. Sir. Yeah, motion's been made and seconded so Sarah you're sort of incorporating by reference the the statements in the, the draft motion yeah okay uh, and Mike, I take it we would, uh, that would become a line item in the next budget, or are there funds available for that? Now? There's some funds available now, and then the suggestion in the draft motion is that you'd entertain, you know, it, it, it's probably, you know, you don't order the council, the manager to put something in the budget, so the wording is you entertain something to consider in the next budget. The, the uh, suggestion that we help set up the 501c3, you know, that's something I could have a dialogue with the commission on, and it, it is something with this type of organization we've helped to, to, to give birth to. Uh, we have helped in the past. Uh, I think the, the best example is the, we did the same thing initially for the uh, Fort Williams Charitable Foundation. Uh, we helped them get started with the, uh, setting up their 501c3. Okay. So could you just, would you just clarify then how this, how we would go forward with the budget with this? Could I, I was, it wasn't clear in, for me. In the short term, there's $902 remaining in the Arts Commission budget. We'd continue to have a dialogue, as the motion says, on how that money is utilized. The, the funds for helping to set up the 501c3 could come out of that, but we can also, there's money in a legal account uh, since knock on wood. Uh, we've done okay since July 1, you know, unless the council objected to that. Uh, and then beyond that, it comes, you know, I would probably include a small appropriation uh, in next year's budget, and the council will consider it when it considers the remainder of the budget based, based on this draft motion, if it passed. And? So is it part of this motion that we are committing to helping set up the 501? The, it, it, contributing to the funds to set up the 501c3 or is it just as in the draft motion that we consider a recommended allocation I, I'm just not sure about the suggestion if it's in or out of the motion the suggestion to uh, help with additional funds for setting up 
I like uh, Alex. I think we should just go with allocation because it's a little vague and we can carve this out in a future workshop. I would be more comfortable with that and not commit at this time to, uh, to helping them figure out the 501c3. That can be done later, but I wouldn't want to sort of commit to it right now. Let's just go with the wording here. The, re the re draft motion. It doesn't preclude. It just says we want to disband that, encourage them to form this independent group and have money, I guess, the money that's already in their budget. And I just want to clarify. If they wanted to use any of their $902 to help this, would you object to the use of the already appropriated funds? I wouldn't. Would you? I, I would not. Okay. No. So I, there's consensus that the funds that are already yeah, in the budget absolutely. would be used well, for this purpose. Could I just comment on that? Is at, at our last meeting, the commission um, voted to um, uh, fund a, uh, a request for a grant for uh, $500. So I'm getting feedback here. Well, I, I, my response to that would be you ought not to, to the extent there are funds available after any grants you have agreed to fund that those could be used on the effort of creating a new entity. Um, so I, I don't think we as a council, at least I don't want to say don't do that because it sounds like you've already had that vote and may have already notified the recipient. So I, it, I so it sounds like the, ba the uncommitted balance yeah, the, is so whatever. $402. So yeah. it's okay with, it would be okay with me if they use that for helping with those funds and they're may well in another uh, decision that the council makes, they may uh, add funds to that. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify, I, you know, I'd like to continue, you know, part of this charge is that I'm to reach out to them and talk about how we can continue to support. And I wouldn't like to foreclose the possibility that I may bring some proposal back to you mm -hmm. that once, and I think some of the hesitancy is, one, there might be some questions, should we be doing it at all? But I think there's also a little bit of hesitancy, if I read in right after 12 and a half years, of a, <laughs> of a reluctance not to commit to something until you really know what the dollars you're talking about would be. That's a good read. All right, so, so you'd like us to bring to you a, a, a proposal with specific dollars? Yeah. And, and you, okay. you'll have the opportunity with or give and take with the town manager uh, to help yeah. you on your way as well. Okay. All right, thank you for coming tonight. Great. All right, so we have a motion, which is essentially the draft motion in our, in our materials for item number 149, 2011, and it's been seconded. All those in favor of the motion? Thank you. The motion carries. Um, item number 150-2011, the Fort Williams Park <coughs> Group Use Policy. Uh, the proposed amendment would add the following underlying language. I'll just read the whole sentence here. That there shall be no alcoholic beverages consumed within the grounds of Fort Williams Park. And then the new language is, unless approved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council in conjunction with a group use request. Uh, Bill, we have the current chair of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Did you wish to speak to this issue at all? Uh, yeah, if, if short, short background would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, this relates to uh, the next item, 151 2011, which is a request by the Maine State Troopers Association to have their annual gathering at the park in September, on a, on a weekday in September, September 13th, 2012. And they had specifically requested to be able to serve um, beer. I think that's only beer. Doug Cropper is here. He's from the uh, Troopers Association. And um, we're seeing, we, the only times we've allowed alcohol in the park were for a governor's convention uh, back in the 80s, I think it was. And then we've, we, also, we authorized it in the spring or early summer for the change of command ceremony for the Coast Guard. Turned out that never happened because it was a rainy day, and so they ended up being indoors, so they never had the gathering at the park. But uh, this is an opportunity for us to generate $3,600 in revenue. There are about 1,200 troopers who are expected to be there, and they're paying $3 a head. So it's a revenue-generating opportunity, and they've asked that um, they be allowed to serve beer. They're giving it away. They're not charging for it. And so we wanted to change this, um, the group use policy to reflect the opportunity for them to serve beer 
in conjunction with a request, a group use request that's been approved by the town council. And we worked with um, Chief Williams uh, and to get his feedback in terms of the issues that should be considered in allowing this to happen. And um, those are the requirements that are uh, enumerated under uh, item 151-2011. Um, there'll be a police officer. It'll be a, it'll be a confined area where the uh, beer will be served. There'll be a there'll be a, a single entrance and exit. There'll be a police officer standing at the exit. Um, if identification is required, you know they'll they'll have to provide it. So these are the these are the guidelines that Chief uh, Williams suggested that we incorporate into this. So. Thank you, Bill. Does anybody have any questions for Bill while he's up at the podium? Frank? Bill, how do you, th how do you think about this as it relates to being a possible precedent for us making um, adjustments to the rules for other events being used as part well, of I mean, <clears throat> as, we're, as we're finishing up the um, revised master plan, one of the things that we're talking about is having a venue for receptions, whether they be company outings or wedding receptions or things of that nature. Mm. Um, I think the reality is if we're going to generate much revenue uh, from those kinds of events, alcohol will in some way have to be able to be a part of those. So, I mean, this, this may be the precursor of something um, that, you know, may become more frequent, but that's not, that's not what this is intended to be. This is a simple, this is a single event, and uh, I think if we get into doing wedding receptions and company outings and things of that sort, you people aren't going to want to approve every single one of them <laughs> in the context of a group use. So, um, you know, for now, this is kind of step A, and then we'll see where we go from here. So from that perspective, I think it's important that, that the success of this is monitored and see if it's a good it's right. a test case. And right. second, make sure that, and it seems like, you know, Chief Williams' point of view on all these issues, hopefully this is a good guideline we can use in the future. Yeah, right. Uh, Caitlin? Just you mentioned that there was alcohol served at the governor's convention. I mean, obviously, this rule wasn't in effect then. Well, this was back in the 80s, I believe, Mike. It was a governor's conference. About 83. So. I don't know if Caitlin was yeah. born then. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I was born that year. Was there, <laughs> was there a ban on alcohol at that time in the park? It, it, the, the operative law is, is the main state law that that does not allow uh, open alcohol out in public. Uh, and, you know, since the park is the public area. However, you know, there's been a, an evolving law over the years that it, you can have an area as long as it's secure, it's, you know, there's a bunch of rules that go with it, that particularly a caterer can get a permit. And you can, you know, it's, you have a caterer, or you, you self-cater, but, you know, we looked at they have host liquor liability and some of these other issues, but, uh, yes, you can do it, but there are there are limitations. But but it originally dated back to a state law that was far more encompassing as to where you were allowed to have alcohol, where not. Just my point is that if we're trying to make this policy change, just I mean, from what it sounds like, because the Maine State Troopers Association is requested to serve alcohol, why do we need to make a policy change if we were able to allow a one instance to occur 28 years ago? That well, this, um, this we policy may not have even been in effect at that time. That's what I'm asking. I'm not sure there was a group use policy. So, And you made the point that you would have this so that, you know, the council doesn't have to make this decision every time, but the way it's worded is that no alcohol will be served unless approved by the Capos with Town Council. So we will have to take every case by case and approve alcohol use. As and what long, criteria uh, are we going to be using? As long as this language is part of the group use policy. I think the policy will probably evolve. If, if we get into something, um, if we do create a venue where receptions can be held and we don't know how many we would want to have during, during the course of a year, um, but I think then we take it to the next level and decide instead of having to have the council approve each request where alcohol is going to be served, then we would come up with some other, maybe that, I mean, I don't know, that would be up to Bob and Mike. It's, Mike. I think the, the, this isn't directly on point, Caitlin, but I think there's a difference between group use request and normal reservations. And right now, you know, in feeling our way through this, 
the Ford Committee has only recommended that we do it in terms of group uses, and nearly all of the group uses are required to come to the Town Council. There's one little window that doesn't need to, but if it involves alcohol, at least in the short term, uh, while we're still piloting, experimenting, the Council would need to review each one. Right. Jim. David, the other thing, Bill, too, was some of the discussion that the Commission was having, that it appeared like the only groups that were getting through with the alcohol component added were military or police. So far, that's... And that was, the, and that was starting to set somewhat of a precedent, and that the feeling was that the group policy, the group use policy, needed to address this alcohol issue separate, because the things that were coming to us were all military or police mm -hmm. and the, the dealing that the, our feeling was that we had to start to separate that out mm -hmm. as we move towards starting to implement some of the potential that would come in the master plan so. are there any other questions Caitlin I just I remember back a few months ago shooting down ideas about the use of the fort because we were jumping in and we hadn't ironed out criteria and and whatnot and so I find this same similar situation coming up, you're asking us to approve the use of um, the consumption of alcohol, which I haven't laid out a criteria as to who will be approved. So our first criteria is if you're the military police or whatever, check, you're approved. What criteria are we going to go forward with on the next person who asks if they can have alcohol at their fort? I just, you, you wrote it, vote, we vote one way for one thing, let's not jump in too soon before we have everything figured out but now we're ready to jump in on another issue before we have everything figured out. I just want to make sure that the council is putting forth a consistent face here. That's all. And I'm comfortable with the uh, proposal. I think, as Mr. Nickerson said, that this is sort of part one, step one, that the uh, council approve uh, requests and Step two is a more uh, rule-based um, type of process. So I'm comfortable with this right now with the understanding that this is step one, uh, an interim kind of thing. And I think it's very appropriate, since this would be a substantive change, that the council, which is the policy-making body of the town, um, be the one who looks at these requests. In the long run, it would be a real pain for all involved to have to come have to have every request come to the town. But at this point, I'm comfortable with this as an interim step. Uh, Sarah? I'd just like to echo Caitlin's frustration. I do see what she's saying, that it, it appears to be quite arbitrary, because someone came to us a couple months ago, won the wedding, we said, no, 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 we've never done that. And now we're like, oh, yeah, this is great. Let's do it, because we've got to see. And the argument then was, it'd be a great way to see how that goes. And it said, no. And now it's like, oh, this is going to be a great way to see how it goes. Oh, yeah, sure. So. I'm comfortable. I'm going to vote for this, but I'd like to acknowledge what Caitlin's saying and say, moving forward, I, I think, and I know you're working on this, I think it would be extremely helpful for us to have a conversation and hash, hash out exactly how we're going to choose these things, you know, on a broad-based way instead of case by case. And, Just to, sort of to that point, um, as you know, the master plan is coming to fruition. It may be presented, I'm not sure, either next month or certainly by January. Um, within the master plan, one of the ten priorities is to um, have, to maybe designate an area for receptions. And um, once we've done that, <clears throat> then the next step would be to, we've engaged a fellow who's going to work with us on putting together business plans for different types of things, and one of them would be probably for receptions, what kind of receptions. Um, do we have you know, certain caterers who are going to be um, authorized? And I mean, setting forth the guidelines, what's the location going to be? I mean, that's part of the master plan is to designate a location, which is something that we have not had before. So this, is, this sort of preempts the, uh, you know, the master plan and the business plan, but it's an opportunity to, rate, to generate $3,600 in the fort next September. And, um, you know, that's folding money. Um, so, I, we, you know, we're just trying to seize opportunities as they seem to be appropriate and come forward. Thank you, Bill. Jim, you had your hand up a minute no, ago. You all said, Frank? Where exactly will this occur within the park? It's going to be on the parade grounds. 
103. All right. Uh, any other questions, comments, or discussion? Caitlin? Just where do we go from here with the next person that comes up? Like, what criteria are we using? That's my, my biggest concern is we're going to, I mean, clearly this sounds like it's going to pass. We're going to approve this, then we're going to approve the main state troopers to be able to serve beer. You say only beer, but in this document here it says beer and wine. Um, anyhow, so the next person that comes next month or whatever, what's our criteria and when will we see a criteria as to what we should follow as to who to approve and who not to approve? That's what I would like. Yeah, just if I might. There's already a, a fairly stringent set of criteria in the group use policy yes. that, that regulates groups and how they use. The only slight difference here is the alcohol one. And to me, that's a rather simple couple of amendments to the existing policy. And, you know, I think the, the commission is this master plan, they, they need to get it done. Uh, they've been working on it quite a while and a lot of other things and are working on it. But, you know, my sense is they should work on amending that coming up with the criteria shortly thereafter. Uh, it does priority. need to be done. But, but I just hate, you know, unless the council insists, I just hate, you know, to to get them sidetracked from what they need to get that right now. It's uh, right, right. the master plan and the business plan was a council goal. And you know all these other things that always come before them, that gets delayed. And I think they need to do that. And I, and I think they can look at these criteria pretty early in the new year. Mm -hmm. Any, Ann? Um, I'll be brief. There, there is a quite substantial and lengthy list on pages two and three of the group, the current group use policy that deals with um, things, information that's reviewed when they're looking at what criteria, when they're looking at what types of groups would be appropriate. Um, things like the financial capability of the group, the number of vehicles anticipated, insurance coverages, exact location, availability of public safety personnel, so on and so forth. So I'm confident that the current criteria are okay for the time being. Uh, Caitlin? Just that Yes, that criteria is all there, and it's been there this whole time, and that's the criteria we use to approve someone to use the park or the area that they're requesting. And then we're adding this extra level. I'm just wondering if there's going to be an added level of criteria where if everybody that's approved to use the park under a group use is also now approved to use it for alcohol. So if, you know, 50 people came in that could have used the park, they would have been fine and dandy, but once you throw in some alcohol with those same people, it might not be the same story, but they're approved under these same criteria. I'm just throwing out that, you know, that caution that we should be going forward with making sure, we're, you know, we have a criteria set in place so that someone can't say, well, you approve them, but, and we have the same thing, we would have followed under these guidelines and you didn't approve us. I just don't want well, just, to have... Just to point of clarification, we didn't say that... Um, the reception couldn't be held in Fort Williams. We simply said it couldn't be held on the green. I'm not talking, I'm not even... No, I thought, I thought you were, general. I thought you were talking about us. You were referring to us, so... No, us as in oh, okay, group, okay. The, the council, if we approve a, a, an event to happen, if we would have approved an event to happen, but now you add alcohol to that same event, it could be a different twist on the event, is all that I'm saying. And if we're using the same criteria, but we're adding alcohol. Alcohol is a, is a whole nother ball game. I'm just saying we should have a criteria so that when we say no to one person and yes to another, we can point to a reason. That's all, so that we have a reason to come back to. And we will, because that's what they're going to give us. Right. That's, that's what, what I'm, you're saying. And that's what I'm saying. I just and that's what Mike's know. saying. Exactly. That, it. that it is coming. That's all that I want. Coming okay. soon. Okay. Um, I think we've been going around a little bit on this, and unless would anybody else like to speak? I'd like to move the question. Uh, okay. The motion. Well, actually, we don't have a motion. Yeah. Thursday night we have a meeting. And, and what's it, and is there any of this on that agenda? No. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll make a motion. A and I think we should deal with item number 150-2011 first. And we'll have that motion and vote on it, and then we can move to the next item. Uh, Sarah? I move that we accept the proposed amendment to the Fort William Park Group Use Policy. Seconded. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. I believe we've thoroughly discussed it. Uh, so, okay. All those in favor of the motion? 
Uh, motion opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Bill, for your time tonight and for staying so late. Uh, uh, item number 151-2011. This is the Maine State Troopers Association Fort Williams Park Use Request. Do I have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, and I just uh, thank you for your interest in using the park, and we hope you, assuming this approves, I hope you have a great event. Uh, thank you very much for considering it. We, have, we are hoping to look very forward to using the park. Um, we have a large contingency of troopers that are planning on coming. We were just down in New York City, <coughs> excuse me, this past September, when they heard there was a chance of coming back to Maine, they were very happy. They are looking forward to it. And it's not just troopers. Um, they bring their families. We have it on a Thursday, so they come in on Wednesday and they spend the whole week. So we're, we're hoping for not just $3,600 into uh, Cape Elizabeth, but into the state of Maine when they come visit and stay in the local Portland, South Portland area. All right. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that may or may not have been caught uh, on the air. The, the, the gentleman who is from the Maine State Troopers Association just spoke and uh, expressed his appreciation for our consideration and also pointed out that a lot of family members would be coming to this event uh, and therefore benefiting the local economy as well. So thank you for coming this evening. Uh, the motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries unanimously. Have a great event. Item number 152-2011 uh, relates to the acceptance of property uh, in the Eastman Meadows development. Um, Mike, would you be willing to give us a little bit of background on Yes. That? Back in, not June 89, 2008, but back in June 2008, uh, the town council agreed to accept this pedestrian easement in an open space uh, on the approved plan. And, you know, I debated whether or not even to have it on the agenda yet, but it, you know, three years have passed since, and it just seems as though you ought to formally accept it. And uh, it, again, it, it adds, uh, you know, more open space to the town's inventory, and also, uh, you know, some pedestrian easements as well that help tie in the green belt uh, uh, to uh, Eastman Road. So, uh, okay, thank you. It's part of the continuing process. Can I ask you a question, question? Yes, Sarah. Does this comply with the rules of the percentage that the developer needs to give and so forth and whatnot? Exactly. Yes, it does. Any other questions? Is there a motion? Ann? I move that the council accept in, co in accordance with the June 2008 vote of the council the pedestrian easement and open space land shown on the approved plan for Eastman Meadows as shown in our packet. I'll second. Thank you. The motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? The motion carries. Thank you. I think it's 10. Okay. Item number 153-2011 is a review of Article 7, Section 6 of the Town Charter. Uh, this was a topic of a workshop uh, on November 7th. Uh, and came as a result of a request from Councillor Jordan that the council look into and consider that substitute teachers be given the same exemption as our volunteer firemen and rescue workers when it comes to holding a position on the council. Um, as the discussion ensued uh, at that workshop, it appeared that we went from the individual uh, being Caitlin Jordan to a Thank you. A, a broader issue, which is how do we define uh, somebody who is working as a substitute teacher? Is that individual uh, who is paid on a per diem basis considered to be an employee? Uh, we also talked about the broader issue of uh, the rescue and fire uh, workers. Um, the, the prospect that there will be uh, several or at least seven of them, or we don't know the exact number, working for the town on a per diem basis, uh, working at the fire station for a, essentially a full work day, uh, and ought we to revisit that issue because suddenly this, uh, these individuals who perhaps are responding sporadically to fire and rescue calls 
now might be working at the fire uh, station on a more regular basis, and ought we to consider that? Uh, the reason why I thought it would be appropriate to put this on tonight's agenda was just to address the limited request uh, that the council look into expanding the exemption to include substitute teachers uh, and not preclude a discussion of some of these other issues that came up, and, and Caitlin brought them to my attention as well uh, in a follow-up conversation that we had. Uh, so, and there was a suggestion that perhaps we just put this off to another day, uh, but it didn't appear to be that there was a whole lot of support on the council for expanding the exemption to include substitute teachers. So my thought was perhaps take care of the issue now, move that off the table, if you will, or off of our things to do list, uh, and perhaps we can consider some of these other issues at a future date. Um, Caitlin? Just with that, if that's the intention of the discussion that's going to ensue, I just want to say it was neither my intention nor my desire to have a charter change occur, but however, if that is the vote that is about to occur, because of my history as a substitute teacher in Cape Elizabeth, I would ask to recuse myself from that vote. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I, I think that would make sense given your direct interest, and I appreciate uh, mm -hmm. your bringing the issue up. Uh, and so do we need to vote yeah. on the recusal? Yes, I'm sorry. It's uh, no, it's late. late. You know. So uh, we do, uh, do we actually need a motion? You've actually made the motion yourself or made the request you. yourself. Je uh, Jessica. I'll second the motion. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? All right. Thank you, Caitlin. Mm -hmm. So returning to that particular issue, is there a motion that somebody would be willing to put forth? <clears throat> or would folks like to have some discussion first? Sarah. I guess I am uncomfortable having this on our agenda because I don't think we have any clarity on it. Not that I want to spend innumerable hours discussing it, but I, I felt at the workshop we left it completely up in the air as to sort of, she had pointed out, I thought it, a good point that there was a, a kind of a huge discrepancy and I didn't think we settled it and so I guess I'm not in favor of voting at all I think we should turf this to some future date on a workshop and just try to get our arms around what to do any other thoughts Jessica no. I, th I think that I mean it bring, brings an interesting question I, I think that it's something that needs to be dealt with and um, I, I'm in favor of approaching this tonight can I say one more thing? Why, do you, why did you feel there was an urgency to deal with it? Well, I, I don't, I think that um, we have a decision from the town attorney on the definition of what is a per diem or part-time employee, and I think that we can uh, approach this in an efficient manner. But we, we only got that opinion because we asked for it because it was requested to be on our agenda, which I, uh, it wasn't put on our agenda as a result of the attorney weighing in. It was put on the agenda for reasons that I don't quite understand, and then the attorney was asked to weigh in. So I guess I feel it's premature to be on the agenda and vote for it, but I may be outvoted on that. Right. And if I could just add some clarity, there was the first attorney opinion that we got, I believe uh, it was almost contemporaneous with the workshop? Or? It was on the 7th, I think. Okay. It was the 7th. Okay. So that was the day of the workshop. Yeah. Would have been. Uh, and and then, just remembering, because he sends emails, he, he sends documents with dates on them, and I think it was the seventh. Right. Second, and, then, yeah. and then the follow-up opinion was really uh, focused on a specific issue of what would be considered to be an employee. Sarah, I don't think there's any urgency to this, uh, but I, I did, didn't see any uh, a tremendous amount of support on the council for expanding the exemption to include substitute teachers. So I, I would like to move the question forward and have a vote on it. But again, if there's a majority of the council that wants to put it off for another day, I'm not going to lose a whole lot of sleep over that. And I think it's important to deal with it now. Councillor Jordan brought it up um, as a question of uh, whether um, the whether an exemption right now. The, the, for people who haven't read the charter, which is probably most people in the town. Right now, the, char the charter of the town says that you cannot be a town councilor and also be employed by the town, and there is an exemption for firefighters, volunteer firefighters, fire, 
firefighters. Um, and Councillor Jordan thought that she would like to have us discuss whether it would be appropriate to expand that exemption so to include substitute teachers of, of, because of her background as being a substitute teacher. She was interested in the subject. And uh, she was disappointed after she had been elected to find out um, that she would not be able to continue to be a substitute teacher while she was also a town counselor. So that's how the question came up in the first place. Uh, during our discussion at the workshop, uh, the argument was made by Councillor Jordan that being a per diem uh, substitute teacher was akin to being a per diem firefighter. Um, and so that was her argument for broadening the exemption. I think we've gotten now uh, two opinions, one the day of the workshop and one that came subsequently that it more specifically addressed the per diem issue. Um, the two opinions from the town attorney to me make it clear that uh, it would be a conflict of interest uh, based on state law and then also based on what we currently have in the charter because there would be uh, an opportunity for um, a, a counselor to be, if employed by the town, to be in a position where they would be perhaps subject in some situation to uh, discipline or direction from a superior and yet ultimately that superior superior's budget might depend on a decision the council made. It would just made things muddy. Um, I think it's for this reason that Councillor Jordan has decided it's best to recuse herself because she would have sort of a, a personal financial interest in such a question. In any event, that's sort of the background for people watching. Um, in any event, I think it's important to just deal with it now. Uh, it was brought up in good faith by Councillor Jordan. I think she needed an answer, wanted an answer. Um, I'd like to have an answer, and I think just dealing with it at a future workshop, I mean, you, it's not going to be me, but you guys have got plenty of other things to do with roosters and other sorts of ordinances to deal with and other sorts of workshop topics. And so um, I think it's sort of good to put this one to bed. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I would not like to, it, to me it does not, rise to the level of importance, since it would affect only one person in town, at least currently, Councillor Jordan, it doesn't rise to the level of importance to have charter change, which is what would be necessary to have um, to, to change this exemption. And a charter change would involve having a charter commission and then setting the, the whole question to the public at a public vote. And to me, it just doesn't seem worth it. So I'd rather put it to bed. Uh, would anybody at this point like to make a motion? I'd like to ask a question. Yeah, oh, sure. Sorry. Are we simply affirming that we're supporting the, uh, the town charter in retaining the exemption for firemen? Or, or are we saying specifically we're not going to create an exemption for uh, substitute teachers? It seems, we, I don't, it seems to me that we're kind of providing a specific answer applying it to a very general um, area. I mean, the general area is we don't want to create any more exemptions for part-time employees. Shouldn't we be making that statement as, a, as, a, as opposed to something very specific regarding part-time teachers? Well, I, that's a good question. And the way I would answer that is the, the re request we received specifically was for the council to look into and consider that substitute teachers be given the same exemption as volunteer firemen and rescue workers when it comes to holding a position on the council. I th if I had my brothers, that would be the issue that we could decide tonight. Um, and to the extent anybody in the council thinks there are broader issues that need to be explored, we are going to be setting our goals for 2012 uh, uh, in the coming months. And we can or cannot, we may or may not decide to put some of these issues on those goals. But I would like to uh, address that specific Just issue. Short question. Um, is there any way? I mean, I, I agree with your statement last week that this exemption shouldn't apply to anybody. And I'm curious as to whether there's any way to um, uh, change the definitions that are used so that we could actually eliminate the exemption for firemen, uh, part-time firemen, without actually doing a, a formal charter change. I, I guess my answer would be that it is so specific in the town charter that, uh, that exempts 
a volunteer member of the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department that I, I think it would be uh, a bit disingenuous to say, oh, suddenly those people don't yeah, fit. The town the attorney event. said we, we, being the town, could be stricter than the general rule, and by laying it out specifically in the charter as an exemption, it's made it specific. My motion would be to affirm the uh, charter as it is and to uh, not um, look at expanding uh, the um, exemptions uh, to include substitute teachers or anybody else at this point. Not looking to expand exemptions. So it's general, period. It's period. Sarah? Which would, have, excuse okay. me, which would, of course, apply to substitute teachers. I guess here's my feeling. I completely agree with what everyone else is saying. It should be a clean, bright line, as you said last week. And I agree that anybody who works for the town in any capacity, per diem, part-time or full-time, should not be able to serve on the elected board. However, that is not the case. So what you're asking us to do now is essentially, I feel, quite hypocritical. Because what we're essentially saying is, let's vote on this really narrow thing to be sure that we we don't expand the exemption, but we have this glaring, you know, problem. It's a contradiction because what we're actually doing is giving an exemption to a, to a fairly sizable body of people. It's absurd. So, but, but we all agree we don't want to change the town charter. I agree with that. So what we're doing is just sort of agreeing for the time being for the sake of convenience to let it be absurd for a while till we think about what else we could do or maybe we just want to stay being absurd. But to then but, but to then vote on some small aspect of it, as though that's going to make it less absurd, feels to me... Uh, Mr. Chairman, Unhelpful. point of order. Unhelpful. Yeah. Okay. Point of order. I'd like to second Anne's motion, and then would discussion well, I didn't understand. I, I thought you would say that vote. you would make a motion. Were oh, you actually I'm sorry. Making a motion? I, I was making a motion. I'm sorry. I, that's, that's okay. I, I, no I, problem. I didn't, I didn't quite... I didn't quite hear you. So can you just restate the motion, please? Oh, God. Okay. That might be Excuse difficult me, at this hour. I didn't understand that Anne had actually um, made a motion. I wanted to affirm the charter as it stands now with all its, uh, and, and not, I want to affirm the charter as it stands now and not expand exemptions. Is there a second? I second it. Okay. Any further discussion? Jim. Just a point of order. Um, what is the council's rule on abstention? Abstention? The council, well, isn't the council rule that... That you have to vote or not? You have to vote, I thought, unless yeah. you recuse yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think if you have and a basis for recusal, then you would do that, but... Uh, the recusal has to be voted on and approved by the rest of the council. Right. Yes. Just asking for clarity, yeah. that's all. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion? Five, all those opposed? Yeah, the motion carries five to one. Thank you. Uh, this is the second opportunity for citizens to discuss items that are not on tonight's agenda. <coughs> if anybody would like to speak to an issue that's not on the agenda, please come forward to the podium. Seeing none. Uh, we, item number 154-2011 is an executive session request. Uh, we have received a request for a hardship abatement and it is recommended that pursuant to Title I of Maine Revised Statutes, Section 405-6F, we enter into an executive session. So moved. Second. Okay. And uh, before we take a vote on that, uh, when we go into an executive session, we will eventually come out of it, but we will no longer be on the air, uh, but we will come out to see if there are any folks out here, and, and to also take a, to a, take a public vote on the abatement report. And I know it's getting late, but before the reporter who's still here leaves, there may be a brief discussion after executive session as well on when you want to set a date for a, uh, the annual caucus of the council. There won't actually be a caucus. There might be a brief discussion on possible dates. Okay. So we have a motion to enter into executive session. It's been seconded. All those in favor? I so move. Okay. Motion carries. I think we already had. Oh, we did. Oh. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. You might want to have that brief discussion even before you go in while Kathy's still here. That's fine. Is December 5th okay? Yeah. Or do you want to do it earlier? Today?